Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Huddersfield Planning Subcommittee meeting. Um, before we get into the agenda, I'd just like to make a, a quick announcement. Um, I'm mindful that we've got several speakers, um, and in the interest of the meeting, if I can um, ask every... Sorry. Um, sorry, in the interest of the, in, of the meeting, if I can ask everybody to try and stick to their scheduled times, please. Um, additionally, um, can we all try and remain as polite and as courteous as we can to one another? Um, we are here to determine and discuss planning matters. Um, so thank you. First item then, membership of the committee. Councillor Sokol. Yeah. Chair, it's an apology from Councillor Sarpa. I don't think there's any more. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, item number two, minutes of the previous meeting. Okay, moved by Councillor Sokol and second by Councillor Paul Davis. Uh, item number three, declarations of interest and lobbying. Can we start with Councillor McGuinn? I have nothing to declare, Chairman. Councillor Firth? Non-Chair. Non-Chair. None, Chair. Thank you. Uh, no, nothing to declare. Nothing to declare, sir. None, Chair. Nothing to declare. Thank you. Councillor Bruce, I missed you out. Sorry, I couldn't. Sorry, right, yeah. Yeah, I do have a declaration to make. It's in respect to item 14. I've provided extensive advice and, and guidance to the applicant in respect to their application. Um, and um, uh, whilst it's not a pecuniary interest, um, I'll not be participating or voting on that item. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor Greaves. Um, I've, I've got nothing to declare. Thank you. Item number four, admission of the public. Um, so all our items will be considered in public. We have no reason to go into a private session. Item number five, deputations and petitions. Thank you. Item number six, public questions. Okay. The next items are the site visits, and I can confirm that we've been on all the site visits that are listed in the agenda this morning. Okay, then the first application, page number 13. Nick. Thank you, Chair. Good day, members. My name is Nicholas Hurst, case officer for this application. This application seeks full planning permission for the erection of 42 dwellings. The site is land off Lingards Road to the west of Slower. Sited along the Cone Valley, the site is upon the valley side with sloping land levels of varying steepness throughout, as was seen on the site visit. For context, Manchester Road runs along the north of the site. The application site largely consists of land allocated for housing within the local plan, reference HS 125. The allocation has an indicative capacity of 36 dwellings. While most allocations had their density calculated at 35 dwellings per hectare, this site's indicative capacity equates to 15 dwellings per hectare. This was influenced during the local plan process by a previous outline permission on the site. However, the outline was which had all matters bar, uh, reserved bar access has since expired and carries little weight in the assessment of this proposal. Each application must be assessed on its own merits and the indicative capacity outlined in the local plan allocation is not a definitive cap, but an indication of expected delivery. Subject to consideration of the material planning considerations, the indicative capacity can be exceeded. Therefore, the principle of residential development on this site, a housing allocation, is acceptable. For information, the proposal has a density of 19 dwellings per hectare, which is still below the typical standard of 35 dwellings per hectare. However, part of the application site, circled in yellow above, is within the green belt. This area is to host the site's attenuation tank uh, for drainage. 
which must be at the low point to enable gravity feeding. While most development within New Greenbelt is restricted, engineering operations which do not harm the openness of the purpose of the Greenbelt can be permitted. The installation of, of the attenuation tank would be considered an engineering operation. While there would be regrading of the land to enable the installation of the tank, post-development it would be grassed over and simply appear as part of the landform. When viewed, the area above the tank would retain its existing character, therefore not harming openness nor the purpose of the Greenbelt. Therefore, the element of development within Greenbelt is considered acceptable. For members' information, the buildings circled in blue are Grade 2 listed, which I shall come on to into detail later. Uh, and the one closest or most related to the site is Lower Wood Farm. The image before you shows the site layout. The proposal includes a mixture of one and two bed flats and three to five bed dwellings. Ten units would front and be accessed from Lingard's Road, as can be seen here. The other 32 would be accessed via a new street from Lingard's Road, which would branch into two parts. Areas of public open space would run through the site with trees and other planting throughout the site, which would be secured via condition. As members saw on the site visit, the steep topography of the land has been a constraint to the development of the site, which has to, had to be addressed through the design. Also, the site is on the edge of the rural environment, uh, and the urban and rural environment, with a green belt sited to the immediate west of the site, which the di designers have also had to address. This image is one of several of the section plans for the site. Units would be predominantly split level, presenting either one or two storeys facing up the hillside, or two or three storeys down. The use of split level dwellings has been to reduce the required reliance and extent of retaining walls, although retaining walls would still be necessary in various locations of the site. This section further elaborates and shows the design response to the site levels. It includes a relationship of several units to properties which front Manchester Road, which can be seen here. The following slides are examples of the proposed dwellings. Due to the site's constraints, a higher than usual number of bespoke house types have been designed as a response. However, across the units, architectural features are considered to reflect modern Pennine vernacular. While three storeys are not prominent in the media area, their inclusion in the Cone Valley is not unusual. The height and mass in the units has been carefully considered to ensure it would not appear incongruous within the setting, and officers feel that this has been achieved. Roof forms would, in places, include asymmetrical slopes. This is a purposeful design feature to keep the height and the massing of the units lower. When viewed from across the valley, the asymmetrical roofs would not be prominent nor cause the site to appear out of keeping. In regard to materials, these would be faced in natural stone with concrete roof tiles. And here is another example of the housing types. And a final example. Given the complexity of the levels, the applicant has provided an indicative montage of the layout for illustrative purposes only. I shall linger on a second for members to view. And then this from the uh, Greenbelt land looking into the site. On the amenity of neighbouring residents, the proposal has sought to secure adequate separation distance for property surrounding the site. This includes a minimum of 21 metres to property, op properties opposite on Lingard Roads, about one nominal shortfall of 20.9, which is not considered a cause for concern, and more than 32 metres to properties fronting Manchester Road, and 29 metres to Lowerwood Farm, giving due regard to the greater topographical differences. The new road, at where it joins Lingard Road, would run close to number 45 Lingard's Road, as shown here. I will note that Lingard's Road does have a conservatory on this location here that is not shown on this plan. The need for the new road to be level with Lingard's Road, where they connect, and that number 45 is slightly below the road level, would result in the road being higher than the ground level and garden level of the dwelling by approximately two metres in close proximity. The, new, the two metre height is where the road would connect onto Lingard's Road, with the level difference and proximity falling as you move into the site, as you see it curves away. Screening up to two metres along the new pavement and planting may be secured via condition to further reduce proposals and impact upon number 45. Furthermore, by virtue of the road uh, to the rear being lower, cited here, Uh, the main outlook from the rear windows would be preserved on number 45. Accordingly, on the planning balance and subject to the suitable screening strategy, the impact on number 45 is considered acceptable. On the matter of the adjacent listed buildings, policy requires due regard to their heritage significance and how a proposal will impact upon them. This is fully detailed within the report. 
However, in summary, policy requires uh, the level of harm to be categorised. In summary, it is accepted that less than substantial harm would be caused to the adjacent listed farmhouse, Lower Wood Farm, through the introduction of new buildings within its historic setting. However, it would retain its existing curtilage, not have its actual historic fabric affected, and have acceptable separation distances from the new properties. In such cases, the less than substantial harm must be weighed against the public benefits, which in this case includes bringing forward housing at a time of national need, and therefore the impact on the historic environment is deemed appropriate. Through you, Chair, I'd now like to invite Ryan Kinder from the Highways Authority to comment on the proposal. Through you, Chair, Ryan Kinder, Highway Development Management. To summarise the highway section of the report, the proposed development is forecast to generate 29 vehicular movements in the AM and PM peak periods. Of this, 90% of the traffic will turn left towards Manchester Road. Given this figure spread over the peak hours is considered negligible and therefore any impact on the existing traffic flows will be minimal. Access to the site will be taken via Lingard Road in the form of an adoptable internal arrangement for the majority of the development. However, 10 units will take direct driveway access off Lingard Road itself. The proposed site access will be in the vicinity of the newly widened arrangement on Lingard Road to accommodate turning in and out of the site for larger vehicles whilst maintaining the existing on-street parking which has been demonstrated on a suitable plan accordingly. Improvements for pedestrian links to and from the site have been conditioned in the form of a footway at the bottom of Lingard Road and new drop crossings at the junction of Springfield Ave and New Tree Lane. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Chair. The report before members outlines officers' full assessment of the proposal in detail. As has been stated, the principle of development on this housing allocation is acceptable and the siting of an attenuation tank in the Greenbelt is also not opposed. Officers consider the layout and the design to be an attractive approach to developing the site, managing to address the difficult topography constraints while representing an appropriate transition from the urban to rural environment that harmonises with the surrounding area. Careful consideration has been given to the amenity of neighbouring residents and has concluded that the proposal would not materially harm their amenity subject to the conditions given. Other material considerations are addressed and found to be acceptable in report, including, but not limited to, drainage and ecology, with technical consultees from the Council's lead local flood authority and ecology group available should members have any questions. The proposal would secure a full policy compliance set of planning obligations, as is detailed within the report. 334 public representations have been received in objection to the proposal, which are considered and responded to within the report and the update. For the reasons outlined and expanded upon within the report, Officers recommend that the application be approved. As per the given recommendation and subject to the additional clarification on the conditions given in the update, that nothing further to add, Chair. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Ryan. First speaker. Okay, so we have a number of speakers. Uh, the first one I've got down is Jackie Howes. Can everybody hear? Hello? Um, my name is Jackie Howes. I've lived at Pippin Cottage, which is about 200 years old, since 1973. It is shown with Lower Wood Farm and Far Lower Wood Farm on the OS maps of 1848 and 1892. There is no other development in the area at the time. And the first development in the area is the Terrace Council Houses, which appear on the Ordnance Survey map in 1930. The only reason Pippin Cottage is important is that it hasn't been shown on any of the drawings up here because it doesn't fit on the map and it isn't shown on all of the development proposals, nor does it appear in any of the comments that I can find from the planners. It is the only property on Lingard's Road which has um, a distance of 1.2 metres from the biggest window in the house to the boundary wall. The developer's heritage statement quotes from the listings, uh, listing information. However, Lower Wood Farm, which is correctly um, described on the listing, was not a row of farmhouse, farm workers' cottages, but a working small holding with a barn and some outhouses when I moved in in 1973. Far Lower Wood Farm, which is the uh, major property which is affected by um, this application and will be surrounded and no longer possible to be a working farm, but it would be if they were allowed to. Both the farms um, were 
run by the same family when I moved in. And it's incorrect to say that Lower Wood Farm is a row of farm workers' cottages. It has had two dwellings altered in it since I've lived there, and I know that because I did one of them. These are inaccuracies. There are many small inaccuracies in the planner's report. I hope, do, do hope they are mistakes. The, these whole site slopes very steeply downhill to the northwest, not just to the north. There are no amenities within walking distance unless you're a very fit bloke. Um, I'm rather an old person and I can do it in about 20 minutes down, but you forget all the way back it's up. And for anybody um, with a push chair or pushing anything else, it is extremely difficult. It's equally difficult to get to the station because it's downhill and uphill. Now, admittedly, the site is extremely difficult. I omitted to say I think that I'm an architect. And the outline planning application, which appeared um, in uh, 14, I think it was, is largely acceptable. You can't really knock it. The proposed development is out of scale with the surroundings. The, the surroundings have no great merit. The dwellings from Access Road are overpowering, so, urban you. in nature. Th th thank you, Ms. House, for your contribution. Um, Sorry? Thank you for your contribution to the meeting. That is the three minutes, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, next one I've got on the list is Robert Bamford. <laughs> Good afternoon. First off, we are not trying to stop this development. We simply want a good quality development which fits with the landscape, local neighbourhood and respects the amenity of existing residents. We have always said our main objection is that the building design, layout and housing density conflict sharply with the rural fringe Pennine Hillside location and will have an unacceptable adverse impact on the landscape and the existing properties bordering the site. We've said this many times to the planners. Isn't it then strange and not a little offensive that the planners don't even mention it in their report to this committee? How dare they say that the proposals are acceptable and not detrimental to the amenity of their neighbouring residents? They don't live here and don't know the neighbourhood like we do. It would take me three hours to tell you everything that's wrong with this proposal. The deeper you dig, the more worms you find. I will therefore focus on two areas where my input may carry more weight, drainage and the local plan. I should say that at one time I was the Yorkshire Water Manager responsible for drainage in Kirklees, Calderdale and Wakefield, so I know about drainage. Why is it acceptable to build the main attenuation tank on very steep slopes where it cannot be maintained or adopted by Yorkshire Water? This means the entire drainage system and all the side roads will never be adopted and a huge burden will fall on residents. Why were the planners scrambling to put more sticking plasters on the drainage problems just two days ago? Why, after four abortive Alice in Wonderland drainage designs, are the proposals still a tangled mess? They definitely will cause flooding to properties along the northern boundary. Why do the planners and developers insist that fundamental design problems, such as drainage and the structural stability of Lingodge Road, have to be dealt with behind closed doors as planning conditions? Are they simply trying to evade public scrutiny? To resolve the drainage problems, it will be necessary to change key aspects of the site layout and design. Local plan. Why is it acceptable to build 42 dwellings on a site allocated 34 dwellings in the local plan? This is a question of honesty and democracy, not how many you can squash in if you bend seconds. the rules. I took part in every local plan hearing and did not expect the plan to be thrown in the bin when convenient to do so. It isn't the local plan. There are lots of other uh, codes and guides that this proposal ignores. Final comment. Planners say it is unreasonable to provide a six-metre carriageway on Lingard's Road because the Highway Design Code only applies to new roads. What rubbish. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've got Stephen Head. Chair, the 
Approximately 24 properties are situated above this site. Approximately 20 properties are situated below this site. Each and every one of those properties will lose amenity, and most will also lose their privacy. Add to this a conservative 100 surrounding properties that will also be impacted by increased traffic, parking and noise. The 2015 outline planning permission, which was only narrowly passed, recommended two-storey dwellings, yet the same planning department are now recommending approval for three-storey buildings, perched on storey high stone plinths on top of raised embankments. This is unacceptable. In fact, that outline permission primarily sought to establish the access point into the site now finds that same point moved over seven metres closer to existing property number 45, with a totally unacceptable two and a half metre raised road a mere four metres from the said property. And the planner's response is, yes, your amenity is compromised. Yes, you will only be able to have a clear outlook to the rear from your conservatory. Yes, we can screen you with a two metre high fence along the pavement, which would imprison us with four metres of height. Yes, we can plant trees around you so no sun can reach you, leaving our modest garden a dark, noisy, fume-filled, overlooked wasteland. And yes, all that is acceptable in an effort to bring the stall site forward. The planners admit that extensive engineering works will be needed if the entrance was moved with a knock-on impact on the height elements of the site. Of course it would, because the whole site is reliant on badly sited dwellings which are too high, our main contention. If the spin dryer effect of pushing houses so close to the boundary, with minimum separation from existing properties, was not adopted, this development would sit unobtrusively into the hillside. I realise that councillors rely on the knowledge of the planners to help them reach a decision, and rightly so. But allowing the planners to deal with this application by conditions will raise considerable sums for the public purse, but will not address the fundamental issues of the design and layout and its adverse impact on the landscape, existing properties and residents. As the planners seem intent on refuting every salient point made that affects this site, leaving a legacy of animosity in the community against this development and those that allowed it that will linger for many years. I say if the developer cannot make this site viable without the detrimental effect of these artificially raised road levels, house levels, overpowering seconds. disregard for the community, then this is surely time for the committee to defer or reject this application. Thank you, Chair. Glenn Rigby. Yes. Thank you, Chair. The government recommend a landscape impact assessment to assess developments. Unfortunately, planners have dismissed the council's own assessment for this site. It is noted the assessment discredits the applicant's design. A design that proposes building houses taller than a three-storey block of flats that would sit nearly four metres above ground level, described as sensitive to the site, following contours. Four metres above ground level is raising contours, not following. I live in a bungalow, single storey with underbuild. Thirteen border the site. Not a single bungalow is proposed, which is at odds with the local plan that says houses of all sizes are needed with an increasing number of bungalows. The proposed dwellings opposite would be up to 250% the floor space of mine. Ten such dwellings would be crammed along a narrow section of Lingos Road, causing massing and introducing traffic and parking issues. Material considerations, like many others, planners appear happy to avert their eyes from or brush under the carpet rather than address, making provably false and misleading statements. Not many making public the mandatory climate change statement, telling some residents not to look up, others not to look backwards to avoid self-evident issues, saying no road issues have been seen without saying any of anyone has looked, saying health and safety is not a material consideration. Proposed dwellings would tower over others from a far more elevated position, making them overbearing. Roof terraces that invite overlooking, which means loss of privacy and amenity, much like the Tate and from a similar distance. The entrance road designed to cause a loss of outlook, forcing residents to pay the cost and not the applicant. Of course, planners report everything's fine. We'll probably hear similar from the applicant's rep. All boxes ticked, just a few conditions and we're good, except it's not. A pre-application consultation, then five submissions and yet another application extension does not scream a good design. Kirkley's House Builders Design Guide says new developments will be integrated into the surrounding context and respond positively to local character, whilst being 
sensitive to its uh, surroundings. Houses taller than flats opposite bungalows would not integrate. They would be overly prominent and not respond positively to local character. They would be visually intrusive, not sensitive to surroundings. There's a Kirkley's local plan review. It says, historically, settlements have pushed outwards along the narrow valley bottom, flanked by steep topography, where development can appear overly prominent and visually intrusive. This site is steep, and this application would deliver exactly what the local plan warns against, no Thank matter how many conditions are attached. I recommend the application be refused. Uh, we've got uh, Kay Wrench. In 2023, I feel we have a duty to think about Slathwaite's future generations. Sadly, here I see little desire to think creatively. As we are told, the legislation isn't quite in place yet. What a missed opportunity. We live very close to a beautiful, wet and windy site, as you will have ev evidenced this morning. The back of my house is heated by the sun as it passes from east to west. West to east? Where are the wind turbines, the heat pumps, the solar panels, the loss of amenity for walkers and cyclists as Lingard's Road is turned into Lingard's Canyon? Even the beautiful sedum roofs in Plan 1 have been replaced by sun terraces and balconies, but sadly, they're on the dark side of the houses. They ain't going to get much sun. And what about the environmental loss, sold off for a £90,000 contribution to what I'm not quite sure? That's not going to benefit us. Social housing is still a block of flats. How does this support levelling up and offer a future that is green and bright for everyone? As you can see from these examples, local residents have a very different interpretation to that which is presented by the planners. With an initial offer of a one-to-one -one meeting, there has been no involvement of the community in this project. And if there had been, I think things could have been very different. Personally, I'm particularly concerned about the impact of this estate on the people who live on Manchester Road at the bottom of the hill. The drainage issue associated with this site is almost embedded in local folklore. We have the most to lose if this scheme is, scheme is not first class. If there is one thing we hoped would be optimal, it was the drainage plans. With 42 large units positioned above us, I fear for the future. Solutions seem to have been suggested, revised, changed, even up to yesterday, and are still subject to condition, with Yorkshire Water using words like as a last resort, and appearing to reject adoption of parts of this system, though I am no drainage expert. Drainage is too important on this site to be left as a condition to a management company. Our houses have been described as a barrier to the view of these large units on this prominent site. Not my words. Other than this, we get mentioned in three paragraphs in a 55-page document with a constant reminder that we have no right to a view. We agree that the proposed development will inevitably change our outlook, but to be told if we don't look up from our steep garden, all will, be fine, all will be fine is seriously offensive and ridiculous. This development is not taking away my view. It's giving me one of six overbearing dwellings dwarfing my house, each over 10 metres high on two and a half metre concrete plinths positioned on a steep slope above us, which will be viewed far and wide across the valley with a bleak positioning that certainly does not help us. Officers have clearly decided these dwellings will not cause material harm to our amenity, but actually we think they will. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we've got Councillor right. Leslie Warner. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm coming at this from two points. One of them as a resident of Slowit, who has witnessed in the three and a half years I've been a councillor in Cong Valley, the changes to the village. There have been so many talks and reassurances as new plans and new houses happen of things that are going to happen that don't. I remember when um, Rob, before he stopped being a councillor, had was really, really annoyed with planning because once again, more housing developments have been allowed in Linthwaite and that is an area with flooding. The number one issue in Cone Valley is that we are wet, it rains a lot, those who've walked around this morning will have seen the, the mud 
and you put more piles of houses and concrete in an area where we get endless problems with runoff and rain. I can't tell you how many houses I go to where paths are being eroded, where unadopted roads are no longer accessible, and this does not seem to be taken into account. It seems an example, once again, of a lack of consultation with locals, lack of transparency, and how on earth this area got on to be the local plan for houses, I don't know. I appreciate that in the present climate, it's easier the government have made it easier to build houses. I also appreciate that planning have lost staff, highways have lost staff, so everybody's under a lot of pressure. But what keeps happening is when, and, and SB homes make lovely houses, although very expensive. And what is worrying me is that we are about to dramatically change a beautiful area of our village. We are still recovering from the fact that Globe Mill was allowed to be built. It's only half full, and the, the, the traffic problems in the village are just ridiculous. Um, it's a suggestion from planning that there's no, going to be no noticeable um, traffic implications as a result of this build. But you, those who know the village know that Lingard's Road is a fast track road at rush hour up to Chain Road for people to get to work. It's mostly a narrow single track road. By the time they build a pavement on it, it will all be single track road. There's a really steep bend. So a, a resident I was talking to recently was just saying she's really worried about the amount of traffic on the road. She's worried about people who are going to school. So let's think about other things as well. There is the, the whole um, situation where there's been promises that there were going to be some ecological steps taken. So on page T, on paragraph 5, it talks about a survey needed for the culverted watercourse downstream of the site will be required and any planning defects need to be rectified. We would like to have a copy of this. I know from Globe Mill that things that were meant to be in place didn't happen beforehand, so we need to be sure that this has been looked at. 4.4 refers to the need for a site-specific flood risk assessment. Again, we need a copy of that. There's a lot of concern from people who live downstream on Manchester Road we, that the waterfall is going to cause even more flooding on Manchester Road than already happens. For example, the, bath, the bus turning circle, it regular, regularly floods. The footpaths going down flood. It is an area that is not suitable for this sort of building that's going to happen. Um, the other thing as well is I know there's money being put aside for a small amount of help with the infrastructure, but if you're going to have 42 homes, that's on average, say, one and a half cars per house. So 60 odd cars in Russia are up and down that road, presumably a similar number of children. I'm told 160,000-ish has been put aside to be shared between the primary school and the secondary school. 160,000 with the constraints that both schools are under at the moment with student numbers and buildings and staff is nothing. What really concerns me more than anything else is that locals have not been consulted enough about a major impact that's going to both impact on their road, their views, their houses. The, the woman I was with in her house this Eight morning, seconds. her lovely view looking out in the Cone Valley will be lost forever. And whilst there's always going to be an aspect of views being lost, to build it on a muddy, wet hillside in the Cone Valley is frankly bonkers. And I think it should be thrown out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just before I move to the next speaker, can I just check that everyone who registered to speak who's in the chamber in objection to the plans, has everyone spoken? Has anyone not spoken? Everyone who's registered? Your name is? I do apologise, I missed you off the list. So, do you want to go next then, David? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. So my name is David Woodhead. Um, our family has lived um, at number 72 Lingard Road since 1989. Uh, that's one of the houses just above the, uh, the entranceway that you've noticed this morning. Uh, we were attracted to living in this part of the Cone Valley um, as it's a point where the kind of urban development finishes and the landscape opens up, which you'll have seen this morning, and it's a much more rural setting and a, a real nice open space, particularly as you move between Slathwaite and, and Marsden. 
It's very popular with people who enjoy open space, who like to escape from all the houses, the shops and the industry. Um, and this can be local residents and many visitors from neighbouring parts of Huddersfield and further afield. I'm objecting to the development in its current format and for two main reasons. One, I believe it's inappropriate in its style, its size and its design for this part of the Cone Valley. And secondly, the design and the positioning of the houses in the development is not sympathetic to the local residents and has a more than fair uh, negative impact on us all. The development in its current format will spoil the area and will not fit into the character of this part of the Cone Valley when viewed either from Lingard Road or Manchester Road, but also for those um, who enjoy looking across from the other side of the valley, uh, which again is fantastic to, to walk around and spend time in. Um, it's essentially a housing development packed with very large houses, uh, which is designed to be tall. Um, it will obviously be an advantage in terms of marketing and selling them at a premium price. The height of the houses will provide lovely you know, aspects for the people that live there, but because of the position at the edge of the boundary, you know, it's the residents that live there now who are uh, it's at our expense. Um, as a resident of Lingaz Road, the ten houses uh, that are built above the entranceway, that climb the hill above the entranceway, uh, these are th three-storey houses on one side, supported by tall plinths, uh, you know, to maximise the height. Uh, and at our side, on the Lingard Road side, the two-storey. But they're very, they're very tall and they're, very, you know, they're as close to the road as could be. And again, moving them you know, away from the uh, side of the road down the hill a little bit would make a tremendous impact uh, and much more acceptable for the people that live in this area. Um, at the point on Lingard Road where the additional houses are to be built, where they... 30 um, seconds where the driveways come out, it's, you'd have noticed this morning, it's a very narrow part of the road, and it's going to make it very awkward for us all, you know, moving our way through. I've asked the members of the committee to seriously consider if this development in its current format is appropriate for this part of the Cone Valley, and also I ask that it's rejected on this basis, uh, as it makes an unfair impact on the current residents, and should the development go ahead, it should be done in a much more sympathetic way and take into account the views of the people that live in this part of Thank Southgate. you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr Woodhead. Thank you for your contribution. OK, thank you. Uh, we've got Councillor Harry McCarthy, who's joining us via Teams. Uh, um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, Thank you, Councillor Ola, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you to the residents who have spoken so eloquently. Um, can I also pass in my apologies for uh, not being here in person to wish Councillor Tyler Hawkins a happy birthday? And can I also pass on apologies from uh, Councillor Matthew McLaughlin, who's attending the funeral of a friend? Uh, I'll start by saying that planners and members of the committee have to make decisions based upon the evidence presented to them in accordance with planning policy and it's not a position that i envy my position as a ward councillor my role means that i have to stand up for and speak to the concerns of my residents which is what i intend to do today the number of public comments that have been lodged on this application really shows the strength of public concern about these proposals in slough and the cone valley uh, the principle underlying residents' concerns is that the current proposals around building design, layout and housing density conflict sharply with the character of the local area while have an adverse impact on the landscape and existing properties bordering the site. While subsequent plans and documentation have gone some way to addressing these concerns, there's still a huge amount of work to be done before they can be addressed fully. Uh, major issues with the development should be addressed prior to it going to committee the local community properly consulted, with residents properly consulted, and in my view, it hasn't been adequately dealt with so far, and this should be refused planning permission. The indicative capacity of this site in the local plan is 36 dwellings, 34 at the application site and two dwellings at the Lingards Road garage site. The proposed 42 dwellings represents a significantly higher housing density and is not in keeping with the character of the Upper Cone Valley. Um, the height of the proposed three-storey properties and associated retaining walls and high-raised platforms and extremely steep slopes will have a huge negative impact on the neighbourhood 
and the wider landscape of Slough and the Cone Valley. Uh, the 2015 landscape and living area assessment uh, made you know, recommendations for two storey units and quite simply the developers stick with the 2015 assessment and limit new buildings to two storeys. Pushing uh, dwellings right up against the southern boundary of the site uh, will come at expensive amenity for existing residents who live just beyond the site boundary. Uh, in my view, the development won't integrate properly with the existing properties on Lingards Road. Um, the Residents Association, who many of uh, uh, are here today, have you know very eloquently and very detailedly exposed how um, the layout of the site really conflicts with the topography. Uh, while it is po positive that some improvements we've made to surface water and land drainage proposals, they still fall significantly behind what is necessary for the site. Uh, the proposed attenuation tank location is still within Greenbelt land, and I cannot see why the tank cannot be placed uh, within the main site boundaries. The very steep slopes and the need for vehicle access will make the uh, maintenance of the attenuation tank very difficult. Uh, the developer has not addressed the land drainage concerns of local residents, and this development will cause flooding to residents' uh, properties on Manchester Road. These are problems that can't be resolved by minor tweaks and conditions post committee, but are fundamental issues with the development and the proposals coming forward. Um, the new properties and driveway access on Lingards Road with shared parking courts has the potential to cause very significant traffic and highways problems on what is already a busy narrow road that is a bus route and is quite used uh, for getting around uh, the Cone Valley. The current plans will cause a number of new residents to park on the road and quite simply uh, the proposals for the width of Lingards Road and the configuration of Lingard Roads um, are unsafe and not adequate. Um, I think I've not used up my time there but uh, just again to reiterate um, my thanks to all the residents who've come today um, to express their views. Okay, so we now have um, Stephen Byram. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Steve Byram. I'm the Managing Director and Founder of SB Homes and the Applicant. My architect Bill Best and Planning Consultant Malcolm Sizer will follow me. Our IOA and Drainage Engineer Martin Rudston will, is here if needed to help any address any questions that may arise from members. I live and work in the Cone Valley, building many of my schemes you will see as you walk or drive through the valley. Our homes are individually designed and built with pride and care. The most recent ones being the Canal Side Development in Empire Way, Slathwaite, and Station House Court in Marsden. We have a skilled retained workforce, mostly all living locally to the valley. For over 25 years we've built up expertise and knowledge of building on the often challenging valley sides. We purchased this particular site once it was allocated as an housing site and had already had an approved ap outline application. We've been working jointly with Kirklees for planning for over two years to get to the point where we're today with a recommendation, recommendation for a detailed approval. We feel this development will bring many benefits to the local community. New housing, social housing, contributions to local schools, new footpath links linking Lingards Road to Manchester Road, open space through the site and footpath links throughout the site. And of course we're fully aware the residents immediately close to the site would rather see the site remain undeveloped. But as a local experienced company, we feel that we are the best place to build this site in what is our valley as well. I'm more than happy to answer any questions members may have. Thank you. Right, so I've got um, William Bess, Martin Huddleston and Malcolm Sizer in that order. So who, who, who's speaking? William, William Bess next, yeah, okay. Chair, members of the subcommittee. This proposed new housing development of 42 dwellings on this challenging sloping site at Lingards Road matches the existing local pattern of development on the hillside by arranging the houses in three rows of dwellings along the contours. The single access road omits the need for a second road onto the site, freeing up space for generous public open space 
landscape with trees, shrubs, and meadow, thus breaking up the development when viewed from across the valley. These connect to the network of proposed footpaths leading from the top of the site to Manchester Road, connecting with the existing footpaths, beneficial to all. Generally, the proposed dwellings are three-storey, built into the slope, presenting two-storey facades facing into the hillside towards Lingard's Road, which has a mix of existing two- and three-storey houses if one includes the ground floor garage stories. Sections have been included in the application which demonstrate the relationship between the new and existing. All the new detached and semi-detached dwellings have generous space between them, allowing new and existing residents good views of the landscape beyond. We have acknowledged the setting of number 45 in relation to the new roads and have moved road two away, losing a dwelling so the road is now level with the garden at a distance of 12 metres. However, the level of the access road one is fixed by Lingard's Road, so we are suggesting a screen fence between the end of the existing hedge and the end of the conservatory, effectively screening the garden from view. I also note the layout has officer's approval, and if the junction was further up Lingard's Road, it would be higher and worse than overlooking. In the northwest corner, the proposed houses opposite the listed Grey 2 farm are a considerable distance back and a minimum distance of 30 metres, separated by open space and farm garden. The proposed two-storey houses in the northwest corner relate in detail to the existing listed cottages and are set back behind a row of established trees. I therefore consider that the proposed development has only minimal impact to the setting of these listed buildings. We've taken on board concerns of the residents, having reduced the number of houses to 42 from 57, introduced greater open space, set the houses well back from the properties along Manchester Road, and have realigned Road 2 and levels to suit the garden of number 45 Lingards. 30 seconds. As regard technical matters such as flooding, drainage, retention and highway design, our team includes well-qualified design engineers who, in consultation with Kirklees Council, flood, drainage and highways officers, have prepared and agreed solutions. In conclusion, the proposed bespoke housing design has been handled sensitively incorporates natural stone facades, traditional details, and is be beneficial to the area, bringing much-needed housing on a site designated for residential development. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, Mark, Mark yeah, Thomas. Thomas. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'm a Chartered Planning Consultant advising the applicant. The principle of residential development of the site is established in its allocation in the Kirklees Local Plan, adopted in 2019. Previously, outline planning permission, including access, had been granted. Prior to submission of the application, neighbouring residents were advised of the draft proposals, concerns related to number of dwellings, building heights and highway issues. My clients have fully taken those concerns on board. Firstly, from an initial submission for 57 dwellings, the number has been reduced to 42. Secondly, the dwellings have been carefully designed to respect the amenity of nearby residents in terms of height, but also overlooking and spacing, such that, as set out at paragraph 1068 in the officer's report, and I quote, the proposed development is considered not to be detrimental to the amenity of neighbouring residents. Thirdly, access and it into and the layout within the site meets Kirklees Highway's requirements. For the benefit of both future and existing residents, the proposals include the provision of a new length of footpath at the lower end of Lingard's Road and improved crossing facilities along, to, along the route to Neald School. It has been more than two years since the application was submitted for your officers to be in a position where they feel that the proposals now before you can be recommended for approval. Eight number dwellings will be affordable in accordance with policy requirements. The section 106 contributions by my client for off-site provision of public open space for biodiversity net gain, sustainable travel and education add up to over a third of a million pounds. I urge you to accept, as do your officers, that the proposals are an appropriate technical and aesthetic solution for the development of this challenging site. Thank you, Chair.
Any more speakers now? We've got... I had Martin on the list, that was all, so... Uh, no, I'm here, you know, um, OK. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers um, for attending this afternoon and for your contributions. Before we go to the main debate, um, I'd like to bring Paul from uh, Drainage in for an overview, please. Good afternoon, Chair, Councillors, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Fand. I work for the Lead Local Flood Authority, which is basically flood risk and drainage, and I've done that since 2009. Previous to that, I've worked for Yorkshire Water in their planning department, formulating adoption agreements and being the adoption inspector for Yorkshire Water for Kirklees, Bradford, East Yorkshire and most of the rest of the region in my time. Um, first of all, there's been several points make and, and made and there's some we can clear up quite quickly. Flood risk assessment is available on the web if anybody needs to look at it and also my responses to that. Um, we've worked closely with the developer, that's why there's been changes uh, in the design. There's, um, I, I wouldn't take it as any inference of incompetence on the part of uh, professionals. It's They come to us with, a, with an idea, we put our... our um, knowledge to them and, um, and, and they um, overcome um, obstacles and um, uh, risk and reduce it and mitigate it accordingly. So we get to a position where we can take um, the, uh, we, we can uh, go to Nick and, 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 and not object, but we would always put conditions on as we would for any major development site because other disciplines might have minor changes and quite we, we want our hat in the ring just in case there's minor changes to drainage on that. So there's nothing really untoward about um, having drainage conditions on there. Um, in terms of consents were mentioned for land, for land drainage, um, in the, if you looked at the site, we have two areas of concern. It's, it, it, it's waterlogged in places. Um, and when you look at it from the, uh, the, the houses on the south side, running through the centre to the north is a... Uh, an old land drain and the vegetation changes there because quite frankly it's not fit for purpose it's broken and water escapes and there's a, a, quite a, a, a large sort of area towards uh, where the uh, open space is in the middle which is a form of pump house where again we've got valves and other pipe work that doesn't work the landowner's entitled to renew those tomorrow without anybody's permission in this room simple as just as if you had a broken gutter or a broken pipe under yours, you would, wouldn't ask permission to do it. You'd just repair your asset. So they can do that tomorrow. And, um, so cassette consent, for what it's worth, would be given anyway. Now, in terms of uh, the number of houses and the concern that how that would impact, um, I do apologise for those that are, have heard me say this often, but we, we do look at trying to mimic the runoff as it was on the field, so it'll be reduced to a rate that's like that, so it's not a case of paving over and everything rushing off and causing havoc downstream. It is throttled back and released slowly for that purpose. And there's guidelines in, national, in the National Planning Policy Framework that, that the developers ad, have to adhere to. And um, I can assure you that they have it, adhered to them, otherwise it would be an objected to. What we do when we look at, um, look at drainage, we, we, we have to follow what they call a hierarchy of disposal for, for the rainwater that hits the roofs and roads. Controversially, perhaps, the, the, the one we have to look at, because it's a national document, is Soakaways, which might work well down in the southeast of England in Kent, but not so well when you've got clay soils in, uh, in, in Kirklees and steep-sided slopes. So we would rule that out. So the developer then has to look at discharging to a watercourse as the next stage of the hierarchy, as opposed to the last resort, which would be a combined public sewer. Hence why Yorkshire Water, as an asset management private company, would look to ensure that we'd, that we'd looked at the other two options first. Now, you will see a blue line running left to right, which is um, a man-made watercourse, uh, which would have um, fed the farms originally. Uh, little is known of it downstream, but there has been an investigation, and it's, uh, as you imagine, where the farms probably been there a lot longer than some of the houses, and as houses have been built, pipes have been moved, it does actually end up in, in, in the combined sewer. I wouldn't be happy with any additional water 
uh, go into that system. So just renewing the land drainage only, which is already there, um, um, is one of the uh, tasks that I presented to uh, SB Homes and, and, and their engineers. What we have, actually, is a series of systems in Manchester Road, and that leads directly to the watercourse and the River Colne. So we can throttle the flows back um, without any impact downstream. In fact, the concerns about negative impacts, we, we, I can allay your fears on that. In fact, I can go much better than that because as part of negotiations uh, and investigations, what we've found is that the, the reason why, uh, I think it's a form of trolley bus turning circle, older, older members will be able to correct me on that, water does pour out of that wall and has done for decades. Um, we, we believe that we can have a good go at solving that as part of this, uh, as a one-off opportunity um, and run the, run the pipe work from that side um, to a point where you see the red line boundary um, to the left northwest. Um, there's a little sort of uh, jut out into the road there. That uh, follows a watercourse that runs down the side of, of the... Um, uh, from north, from south to north, Nick, we've got a, an actual water course which is running over land. Again, the systems in this area are damaged and have not been um, repaired by the landowner. So what we would do there is take out what is an old stone culvert, dilapidated, increase its size quite dramatically and run it across the other side of Manchester Road where uh, it goes into an open water course in the cemetery. So it's, an it's a chance to improve uh, drainage networks and flood risk outside the actual site boundary. Um, in terms of uh, adoption for Yorkshire Water, you know, I don't work for Yorkshire Water anymore. It would be perhaps inappropriate to, um, to represent them just to say that adoptions are handled under Section 104 of the Water Industry Act 1991. So it's separate legislation and that is a private agreement. And uh, it's, it's, although you may, you may be concerned about it, it's not something that you can influence from this chamber. Having said that, there is an obligation from 2015. It was Eric Pickles in, a, um, in Parliament, uh, a House of Commons written paper that tried to, tried to strengthen the process. It, it has its critics, but it gives an obligation for planning authorities to ensure the maintenance and management of systems um, just in case water companies don't adopt or a, uh, a developer doesn't elect not to adopt it, which is their right. Think of a gated community. Where, where roads aren't adopted and everything remains private. That's allowed to happen. It's, it's not the law that you have to do it. But what we would do in Kirklees, and we're at the forefront of it, really, because I don't think any of the West, West Yorkshire Council will do it. You've got two options. You can put a condition on, but it's much, much more stronger to have a management company take on the responsibility, because it is ensuring the management for the lifetime of the system now, adoption, if it comes, may come two or three years down the line. So if we have a management company look after it, you don't get in the position, or we try not to get in the position where developers go bust, it doesn't get adopted, and it's left to the residents to fend for themselves. If we get something in place with a, an itinerary and a schedule of how to maintain it, at least we've got something that's behind if Yorkshire were to choose, or the developer chooses not to adopt with them. Um, I think that summarises most parts. If you've got any questions, Chair... Thank you, um, Paul. Um, so it's over to, to members then. Um, who's going to kick us off? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor McCartney, McCarthy and his uh, birthday wishes, and thank you, Council Warner and, and the residents for coming here and expressing their views. We all appreciate hearing those and, and respect those, and I hope they will see, see, feel the same way about my views, which uh, I don't think are necessarily going to be uh, pleasing to hear, but I do want to, I think, before I make a decision, I owe you the, my, my judgment and thought process that, that I've gone through, and, but, but sort of the evidence that's been put before us. Um, so I'll go on a couple of the issues that have been raised and what my interpretation of those are, and I can't go through all of them. Like, like Spud said, we could be for hours on end if I was to go through. But the, the main ones that I picked up on that have been referenced regarding the design of the house and making sure that they're in keeping with the area. Um, as you can see from those, sort of the surrounded dwellings, and you know, I, know, I know the valley quite well as well, there, there is no sort of set design for that area of the house, um, for housing, should I say, but personally, I feel the suggested designs that are there 
uh, respectfully in keeping with the character of the other dwarves. Well, not identical. They are sort of broadly in line, is, is my view, anyway. Um, in terms of the uh, guidance of the local plan, uh, I, I, again, I would say that is guidance, not gospel. I think you know, we're seeing at the moment how um, situations are developing with housing requirements, and that's, uh, that's something that is used as a guide and not as a, a concrete confinement which we are working within. Uh, in terms of the drainage and, and, and the flooding, the, the conditions are in there in here, but I would appreciate hearing further from the uh, uh, developer uh, on this about what, in, what further work is going to take place from that and what improvements are going to be made with the runoff. I would appreciate some, some follow-up on that after this. Um, in terms of the height of the properties, I think, as we discussed, the nature of the topography, it's, um, that, that basically means the height of the properties is required to be like that. I feel that is, when going around there this, uh, this morning, that felt like you know, it's, it's a difficult terrain that they're, they're going to be built upon, and I think higher properties will be more, more suitable there, in my, in my view, again. Um, Traffic and parking is one that I do have uh, completely agree with the concerns there, and I would, I would appreciate some further more on that. You know, the road, particularly along Lingard, is very narrow, as we saw this morning, and uh, vehicles parked on there as well are going to make uh, you know, even more vehicles coming in more, a more challenging area, and I think that's definitely something... Uh, I would appreciate a bit, bit more from from here, a bit more from highways on that, and I think it's something going forward. Uh, should this, uh, should my um, your fellow members of the panel vote to approve as well, that is something that Kirklees does need to monitor going along Lingard's Road very much so. Um, as the environmental impact, I think there is, is destined to be an environmental impact when you're dealing with a development like this. Um, obviously, any development will have that, but I, it is certainly my hope, and from what we've heard of the Section 106 provision, uh, will offset this somewhat. That is, again, that is my hope uh, on that. Uh, but going through all this, as I say, I see... Uh, no grounds for refusal, which would be, uh, which would hold up upon appeal, uh, and that's something for me. Appeals is very important; they're very costly to the taxpayers, and we must make sure that if we are doing a refusal, that we have a watertight case. Uh, and unfortunately, as I say, while I appreciate and do greatly sympathise with the residents' views for the, which have expressed, that watertight case I do not see. It's, it's, but I owe you my view before I cast my vote. That is my view. I'll open up to others as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, Councillor Davis, Paul Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, very similar views to Councillor Hawkins, who's, who's put them very clearly. Uh, you know, absolutely recognise uh, the concerns of local residents. And, you know, if, if any of us uh, were living in Arlingard's Road, I'm sure, uh, you know, we'd have similar concerns and similar fear, uh, uh, fears and, and, and uh, upset, be upset about the fact that uh, a development is is going to appear where once there was a there was a field, but I think as Councillor Hawkins says, uh, in terms of planning, we obviously have to make decisions uh, around material issues relevant to planning, um, and some of the key issues, which I'm I'm I am a little bit more assured now, uh, that have been raised around drainage, and, and thanks Paul for outlining that, um, you know, are clearly. Uh, critical. I think we all saw that today when we were, when we were visited. You know, with the slope, uh, I'm sure that you know there certainly is runoff of water. And clearly, when you build uh, uh, in in any area such as that, then there's an issue. Um, I, I think I again I, I'm pretty much um, covered the issues I've gone through. I've still got, I guess, a little concern around the attenuation uh, tank and the ongoing maintenance and the management. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about how that would work in terms of the safeguards, in terms of the management of that going forward. And that would be my main, main area. And in terms of, and, and in terms of the, you know, the sort of um, the, the, the life of, of that system, in the sense that is it, is it you know, our, our residents going to find in 20 years' time they're going to be issues? So it'd be good to hear a little bit more about that element of the drainage. But the, re the rest, of, I'm pretty much assured on. In terms of density, again, I can understand residents raising this issue, but when you compare this to densities um, across other developments, uh, this certainly is not overdeveloped in that regard. Though so appreciate uh, that residents are looking at the initial. Um, uh, projections in terms of the local plan, but certainly density-wise, I, I don't believe that's a, that's a critical issue. The, the issue around the three levels, we, we talked about this on site today, and um, um, uh, um, 
again, an important issue. The, the buildings are split level. Um, you know, the explanation we had, uh, which absolutely makes sense to me, is that the split levels were put in place in order to ensure that there weren't, weren't lots of large retaining walls across the development, which would certainly be out of character and would certainly make uh, the development look uh, pretty ugly in terms of uh, its location. So therefore, the split levels uh, were buildings were actually achieving that outcome of building in a difficult terrain without creating those extra walls. So for me, that again makes absolute sense. And I, you know, I think we can only apologise to everybody in terms of people losing the amenity of the views. Uh, unfortunately, that isn't something uh, we can make decisions on. Um, that that is something. Which, which planning doesn't cover in, in that sense. And I, and I think all of us, as I said, if we were living on, the, on that top row of houses, would certainly feel aggrieved. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but very similar to, to uh, Councillor Hawkins at the moment, uh, I'm, I'm not seeing any significant material issues at the moment, but I would like to hear a little bit more about that attenuation tank, the management of that, and... Uh, you know, what that life is, what happens when it gets to the end of its, its life and how that, that goes forward. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Sokol. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I have listened to the speaker on here and uh, um, taken into account what their main objections are around drainage, highways, and density, yeah? We got a very professional, experienced officer, drainage officer, who explained to all of them the, how they had taken all the steps, yeah? And he, he is satisfied with that, and he offers the, some management company as well to look at those drainage systems for life as well. And Mr. Chair, I don't know, I was reading, going through the report, there are 295, so nearly 300 objectors yeah, who are objecting this application. I don't know 300 live on the Lenga Road or the nearby, yeah? I don't know. So main objection should be considered and to the people living on, on the road or nearby on the side, not people away from that uh, side. Anyway, that's, that's up to them, that's no this. I think the officer have considered the application and they done a very good negotiation with the developer. The original application by 57 houses and they reduced to 42 houses. It's a big drop. It's a big drop to take into account. And the parking, is there are off-street off park, parking on there, every house there, yeah. And if we go through the housing structure, we got a good mixture of houses, yeah. We got one bedroom flat, two bedroom flat, five, three bed, four bedroom, and five beds as well. It accommodates the needs of the local communities there. That's a good mixture. Yeah. yeah, I know some member uh, speakers have raised the education uh, contribution, education not good enough. But to me, I think it, it depends on the size of the school over there. I don't know how big the school is on the Lenga Road nearby. They offer the education it's a hundred and sixty one thousand I think it's a good quite good uh, comparing with only forty two houses are there so uh, we got a affordable house eight twenty percent eight houses they are open space contribution and others yeah as my colleague has said mr chair I think it's very difficult looking into the application as we go go down to, to refuse the not not possible yet. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sokol. Councillor Marchington. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
Yeah, just a, just a few comments uh, contributing to the debate. I mean, given the the difficult nature of the site, the, the sloping nature of the site, I think I think the reduction of the number of dwellings from 57 to 42 is quite significant. Um, and I know elsewhere that's one of the things we've pushed for. Given that um, so, you know some people, you know. Um, People might not prefer the site not to be developed well if it is going to be de developed in the principle of that. That's a reduction. Um, in terms of the design, and again, comparing it with other developments in the Cone Valley, um, I think the fact that they are stone built, and that hasn't always happened with developments in the Cone Valley, they will blend and mellow over time, uh, which will improve the visual immunity, immunity. Um, I think I appreciate um, the, the topography. Uh, again, that you look at the lines, I find the indicative drawing particularly useful. Um, and the, there does seem to be a significant attempt to actually use the topography of the ground um, and that's sympathetic, and that is in keeping with other developments elsewhere in the Cone Valley. Um, again, the heights of properties is always a concern, and I think, and again, I do appreciate what's been said about the, the space in between the properties to facilitate as good a view as, as possible, notwithstanding that some residents are going to, you're going to be looking at on a development which we don't like. Um, so, I think Yes, it's looking at steps to try and make it make it more accept acceptable. Um, I think I appreciate what I think, Paul you said about the drainage. Um, yes, it, it was a trolley bus turning circle. The trolley pole, poles are only just coming out. <laughs> uh, I don't remember the trolley. So, um, but I appreciate what you said about the opportunities to improve drainage uh, routes that might have degraded over time. And certainly what we found in Milnes Bridge, uh, when, when there was significant flooding at Bridgecroft, that was the issue. The existing draining wasn't working. Actually, water was coming back up through, um, and that has made a massive difference. So if we can get improvements uh, to that, there might be you know, some potential. And that, that section, you know, there, are, there are sections of Manchester Road which are subject to con continuous and significant funding, funding, mainly West Lathway, and I know there's work going on all the time so if we can do that so seeking opportunities to do that will be great one of the concerns we've had particularly in the in the lower cone valley in areas with a similar topography uh, underlying claims is actually um, while there's the development going on and trying to ensure that if there is a significant rainfall event during development we can try and minimize any runoff and and so so and i think um We've, we've appreciated that as a committee in the past. So it's not just when the development's done, it's actually during development. So if we can, you know, during development, we can make sure that there's not additional risk to, to adjacent properties or around. Um, and that's the way it's, it's managing the ordering of works and stuff uh, and things like that. Um, I think the other issue I'd say about cumulative impact for, for um vehicles within the Cone Valley um, and it you know it's 29 vehicles during the morning peak um, which you can get them in and off site they are mainly turning left onto Lingard's Road um, I do cycle uh, and and use my vehicle on that route fairly and rarely and you do see vehicles queuing from Lingard's Road onto Manchester Road during the mon morning peak and most of those vehicles coming off will be adding to that so, um, and it's one of those di difficulties about looking at the development on the site as an individual. There is a cumulative impact, um, and whether over time colleagues from the highways department and colleagues in the, you know, council colleagues in the Cone Valley can actually look at what we can do in terms of um, travel up and down the Manchester Road, and particularly that area. And we can see, you can see on the, yeah, on the western side of the, the, the diagrams and stuff that access onto, from Lingards onto Manchester Road. Um, and I think we do need to be aware as, as developments going in, in the Cone Valley, how that happens. And obviously this is not the most significant um, development which is going to be feeding traffic into Manchester Road uh, over time. There's, there's more significant developments in, um, in Linthwaite, lower down to, to west of the site. Black Rock Mills I don't know, is not fully developed yet. And there's other stuff. And there's, there's, there's developments in Cowles, lay between Cowles and Linthwaite, all of which are going to add to traffic on Manchester Road. And we do at some stage need to have a, a view to, to what happens uh, east of Long Roy Bridge, <laughs> um, you've got a lot of you know a lot of traffic, a lot of dwellings uh, in the upper, the lower and upper Cone Valley. So uh, those would be my uh, my concerns. I think I've um, yeah, I think that's covered the points I would want to make. Thank you, Councillor Marchington, um, Councillor Greaves. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, this, this is another one of those uh, beyond the edge uh, greenfield sites. Um, it's, it's, it is quite clear that there's substantial local opposition towards the development. Um, and I think 
we're back to the issue of, of, of this continual spread of, of um, our, our villages, and this takes Slathway a bit further up Manchester Road. Um, it says that, that the development's within 800 metres of Slathway Centre, but obviously you've got to get across Manchester Road for that. Um, and whilst there is a zebra crossing to get across there, um, the, the road itself, if you're driving it or on a bicycle, aren't the easiest. If you're walking, yeah, I would say it's even harder. Zebra crossings on, on busy main roads uh, are not the easiest to get across. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised that there's no element of, of improving those walking routes. Um, uh, at, at the least, I would have thought that perhaps they'd be looking to upgrade that zebra crossing to a puffing, make it a signalised crossing. Um, which would make it far, far safer for people to, to get in and out of Slathway by foot. Uh, not just from this estate, but uh, from, from that side of the valley. Um, there's, there's, there's two key issues for me. One, one relates to, I think it's number 45, that access road that goes in. Uh, and it, without doubt... Um, that really is going to have quite a detrimental effect on the amenity of, the, of those folk. Um, I, I appreciate that the road doesn't follow the fence, it moves away from it, but it's still going to be quite a visually prominent feature from the back of their house, um, notwithstanding all the new houses as well. Um, again, the suggestion that there may be some boundary treatment, I, I'm just not really sure why at this stage that, you know, the, the, the screening, um, and the protection of, of those residents' amenities hasn't been nailed down. Um, I've, I've seen some of the work of uh, SB Homes in, in the centre of Slathway. I think they've, they've done a good job with that. They certainly seem to be committed to the local area, so I'd, I'd hope that they would be keen and willing to do what they can to, to, to help neighbours. But there is a, there's a fundamental issue with this proposal, uh, and it's to me, and that's in respect of the affordable housing, the social units. So I appreciate the flats, but we do normally look, look for pepper potting of affordable housing units across the development. So we don't end up with something like a council cul-de-sac, which is exactly what we've got with this proposal. Um, there's, there's a 1068 really hits, uh, uh, so page 44, 10.68 relates to the, the amenity of neighbouring residents and, and to the uh, amenity of future residents. And I've got a question whether or not those affordable housing flats, of the, whether their amenity is really being considered. No gardens. Uh, they're at some distance from the open space on site. Even greater distance from any play provision off site. Um, there's parking, but not adjacent to the flats. Um, one of the, let's see if I can find it, one of the, uh, one of the flats, one of the two bedroom flats looks directly out to a retaining wall structure. It feels, it feels like the, the social, the, the affordable housing flats are, are a bit of a afterthought. Um, I, I, we ask for 20%, but when we ask for 20%, we're looking for a mix of units. So... Whilst there's one, two, three, four, five bedrooms on this site, it's all of the smaller ones. Our target is 20%. If you look at the built percentage, it's, it's minute. It's nowhere near 20%. If you look at the, um, uh, the, 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 the gross area of, of all the developments. Um, and I know that the justification for this is that um, it's down to the fact that there's a need for one to two bedroomed housing in Kirklees Rural West. That's true, there is. But specifically for older people. So if these flats are designed for older people, is this really the right location for them? Um, it, it's at some distance from any amenity. So if the family homes, uh, one or two bedroom flats, they're not particularly well located. If these are supposed to be retirement living scheme homes, they're not particularly well located either. I, I just feel that this, this social element is just me, meeting the requirement and it 
and it, to me, it, it simply doesn't. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Greaves. Can I, uh, Councillor McGuinn next, and then Councillor Homewood after. Bent. Yeah. Uh, I've got, following from what Councillor Greaves was saying about the the entrance entrance road to, and the effect on number 45, I think it has a very detrimental effect on them on, on their immunity, and I, I want want. Could it be considered to move that entrance away from 45? Because I think in my, I'm minded to oppose this because just because because of that detrimental effect on number 45. If if it, it's just too much effect on them, I, I was there. I walked down the field. I could see well, what it would do to their to, not not just a view. Just that you'd be boxed in. By, they'd have to screen it so much. You, you would be, what would you be seeing? And that's all I've got to say. So I, I'm saying I'm minded to oppose it unless you could change the the entrance road in. I think that really going through. I take what Councillor Hawkins was saying and Councillor Gabes was saying about it's very hard to oppose this because it's in the local plan. You've got to have good good. Solid building, yeah, yeah. You can shake your head, but I didn't vote for the local plan. It was voted through. I voted against it. Nothing I can do about it. That is the Kirkleysers. They they have decided this is a building allocation, and take bearing in mind what he said, what Councillor Walking said about right. If we if this goes to appeal, that the authority could be liable for costs if, it, if it's seen as a frivolous objection. But I don't think this is a frivolous objection to look at what, what the effect is on number 45 Lingard Road. So in my, in my opinion, I, I think we should oppose this because of loss of immunity to number 45. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGuinn, Councillor Holmwood, and then Councillor Davis. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just, just a couple of points. Just on what was raised about affordable housing, um, I understand the point that Councillor Greaves was making. I, I just think that we obviously need to look at each of these cases individually on the merits. And I can see the benefit here of having all um, affordable rented homes, because my concern sometimes with these developments is we put something in a four-bedroom house as affordable housing and it gets, you know, whatever the reduction is at sale price. Is that genuinely affordable for most people in that, in that, in that area? Um, whereas actually here we'll have 100% of those as affordable rented units. Which, which, based on what we then hear about what, what's needed in the area, seems to align with what's, what's needed. So, well, that's what our officers are telling us. So, I think we have to think a bit of balance on that. And actually, um, that, you know, I'm not too uncomfortable with that position. Um, I think just for me, I agree with really what most of my other colleagues have said. I think there's a bit of a difference in opinion, basically, between what it says in the, in the report here around the types of properties and the urban design and, and what, what the residents' views are on that. Um, and, you know, if we look at the report, it's telling us that actually this is really innovative in terms of the design, making it kind of fit with the lo locality. Clearly, some of the residents don't, don't agree with that, but to me, I'm sort of more minded to, to, to take the view that's in, in the report because I just don't think that probably what the residents would like to see there is actually deliverable on, on the site based on the information that we've heard. And sounds like there's been a lot of work done to actually, um, you know, create something that is both achievable on the site and has as much of the benefits in terms of the design and in keeping with the, the locality. Um, so for me, and I think the questions in terms of drainage, I think have been pretty well, well answered in terms of the details on that. Um, so, Chair, I'm happy to move the, the officer recommendation to approve, if, if that's okay. Thank you, Councillor Homewood. Councillor Davis? Yeah, I think broadly been covered um, by Councillor Homewood. It was the affordable homes. Um, I absolutely agree. You know, we've got a, a, a dramatic you know, uh, need for affordable rented properties um, throughout uh, Kirklees, and, and particularly within the valleys. Um, and certainly for young people, uh, I think Councillor Greaves might be right that you know the one bedrooms might be aimed at older people, but also we've got a huge problem uh, with younger people just literally unable to access uh, their own homes, their own accommodation. So I think this is you know it, it's not a huge contribution, but it is a contribution uh, towards that. One of the things that concerns me, and I raised it when we were on our site visit. Um, we sometimes see with developers 
where they put in really good proposals with affordable homes, uh, and then uh, somewhere down the track when the development proceeds, uh, we have an, uh, uh, a request from, uh, from developers saying that, uh, unfortunately, um, the profit margins are not what they thought they were going to be, and therefore they need to look at the viability uh, of <coughs> providing all those homes. I am reassured to some degree on, on this one in terms of the amount of work that's gone on pre-application with officers in developing the site, um, and I think the work that's gone on um, uh, gives me some confidence that that won't be a case. But I'm, I'm, it's a comment. I know it's not a con it's not a condition. We can't do anything about viability, but it is a comment for the developers that you know I'm sure uh, that. You know, as was explained, they're part of the community. They understand the need for these affordable homes, and for, um, for us and for the people uh, of the valley, that's a crucial element of this development. So, uh, really want to make sure that we don't get up, get into a discussion some way down the line of viability issues and therefore reductions in numbers around that. But certainly, support uh, the view on rented um, affordable properties absolutely crucial. Uh, Councillor Greaves. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Can we hear from officers about uh, Kirkley's policy on affordable housing and the appropriate mix of units, please? We'll come to the officers um, in a moment, Councillor Greaves. I've got a big long list um, from um, Councillor Sokol. Yeah, Chair, uh, the recommendation of the officer have been moved by Councillor James Homeward. Uh it's in local plan, outlining has been permit granted before, so I'm going to second the purpose. Thank you, Councillor Sokol. So we have a mover and a seconder, Councillor Suli, Suli Richards. Sorry, I'd just like to echo Ch Councillor Greaves' comments about the affordable properties being one-bedroom flats and, and having little amenity and not being anywhere near the, the, the open green spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Donald Firth. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Well, I've listened with great intent today to this plan, both from our planning officers and from the general public. And you know, what, I, what is said, there is always two sides to a story. And I've got to say that the residents have put a good case forward they're not, they're not, what they've come up with isn't stupid, it's logical, a lot of it. I have to thank the planners and uh, specifically the getting uh, uh, involved with the builder. They've been on with this for probably two years, which is, which is something I would say is good, because generally it's, it, we don't know too much about it, nobody takes too much notice of it. But I've got to say from the point of view of their objections, uh, a lot of it is common sense. I've sat on this planning committee for many years and I've always found that local people's input, you know, or, uh, is, is, is always something to take into consideration because problems do raise their heads when the buildings are done and when they take place, we get things like flooding and things like that which would nobody have ever taken into consideration. Uh, and it isn't the best site in the world, but from the point of view of the local builder, I think the local people want to think themselves lucky they've got a local builder. I mean, I know this builder, I've seen his, prop, I've seen his building, and he's, he's, he makes a good job at everything that he does, I've got to say that. He's, he's an excellent builder, uh, unlike some of the building I've seen around our way, he's, he's excellent. So I think you really want to think yourself lucky that you've got a guy, and he'll probably listen to you as well. If he's, if he's sat there and, and, and anybody comes up with something that he's not thought of, I'm sure he'll listen. Um, he's a chap that takes notice, and he's a local man, so he doesn't want to build anything that's going to be wrong. So um, that's all I've got to say, but as I say, always remember that planners don't know everything and please take notice sometimes of what the residents have to say because their objections can be quite good. 
they've done a lot of thinking, a lot of thought gone into some of their objections today. It's not nimbyism, it's just a case of we think this is what should be done. We live here. I don't live there. The planners don't live there. The only guy that lives there is the builder, so I'm sure he will go and support whatever they want in small doors. I'm sure he will. Um, I, can't say, I won't say any more, but I will say that uh, it's not an easy one. Lingard's Lane isn't a wide lane. I, I've driven up Lingard's many times, and by the time you've got to Ponted Chain, you've got to wait a motor car, probably. <laughs> and you hope you never meet anybody who can wait another way. So that's my thoughts on it. Um, obviously, I don't want to knock it because uh, it'll go on forever and ever. And might I just thank Kirkley's Council for bringing our, plan our uh, flood officer in because he's all the time taking off the notice of that gentleman. He knows what he's talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Firth. Um, so, uh, over to the officers. What I've got is uh, the, atten the attenuation tank, um, the parking, um, Council Greaves raised um, the, 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 the affordable housing, um, the size, the width of the road, and the screening of the fence. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, and thank you, members, for your comments and, and debates. Much appreciated. Uh, in the first instance, I'll bring in Paul Farndale, in that case, just to mention about the attenuation, the management and the maintenance of that moving forward. Uh, through you, Chair. It was uh, Councillor Davis that, that, that raised this, but talking through you, Chair. Um, it's not a perfect world, uh, and the powers that we've got and are given and can use could be argued that don't go far enough. Um, what I would say is it, there are examples in an ex-Yorkshire Water Inspector where Yorkshire Water walk away sometimes uh, when things don't go to plan. Um, but we are looking at a, a plan, not the construction of. What we can use, is, as I mentioned before, is the Section 106 agreement, so we we'll make it legally binding to set up a management company to try and protect future residents in case, for whatever reason, the adoption doesn't happen. Now, how we would work that is that the concept of a management company is set up, but with that we will bolt on, provided by the developer, um, what I would like to see is a risk assessment, and from that risk assessment, is, you know, it's how you, how you safely operate a system, a bit like when you're handing over a building. And under what we call construction design and management regulations, any sort of construction has got to be overseen by a nominated principal designer. It's so you can trace it back through the system when things don't go quite right. And what we, what we try and aim to do now in the council is taken some time to get to this position and, 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 and adopt what I call it. It's a, it's a changing culture. And um, what we'll try and get is, is that they, they go through that process where somebody's got to oversee the design with the health and safety and operation in mind. So from that risk assessment would come a method statement, and from that method statement we'd have an itinerary of, of how to maintain, which they've got to produce and we've got to see, and a schedule of, of, of when they're going to do that. Now, as a belt and braces approach, I'll include that in a condition, um, and the condition will be pre-commencement. Just think it's just a, a belt and braces in case it's, it's an oversight and, and, and it's not monitored. At least, at least we've got that as, a, as you know, we've got it in two places to attach to that. In, you, uh, you did mention about lifespan. Um, quite a difficult one to answer, and the only way I can think I can answer it is in a is in a compare and contrast. I don't know if you've ever walked past a building site that seems to have what looked like huge milk crates above the ground. And, and they're, they're an attenuation system in their own right, and it's in all the construction manual textbooks. The, the lightweight, the, 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 uh, they think it's a, a lot more safe to put in. But in my opinion, these systems, which, are, which Yorkshire Water were reluctant to take on, but under current guidelines have to consider them now. I, I have my concerns about such a system for two reasons, because what it is, it's, there's all these struts and ties, and you can't get a camera in to inspect. So once it's buried, 
how do you know that it's in working order or how do you know it's deteriorating and it's covered in a membrane that is, that is heat fusion sealed so without being flippant if you imagine buying a, a, a fish at the counter at Morrison's and they put it in a bag and seal it like that it's an industrial version of that but once it's buried how do I know that somebody's not dug down to lay a service and ripped through it etc etc so I will always argue and stick my head above the parapet ready for it to be knocked off as sometimes people try and do um, it, it is to not recommend them on, on estates. Uh, it's a bit of a losing battle, but so far we've kept them off, but I can see it coming in and being mandatory that we have to accept those. These systems don't ha carry what we call a water industry standard, a, a, a whiz number. Um, they, a lot of them don't have um, a certification for what we call the, the uh, I think it's the British Board of Agrimont, which is an independent testing uh, system for various construction products. You'll see it on um, uh, ex, ex, you know, windows, extensions, uh, you know, conservatories, anything like, anything like that. There are products that have gone through that will give you um, at least a statement from this uh, recognised national institution about a, 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 an estimated longevity. And of those systems that I've just described, it, 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 it says 50 years, so what I would want to see, even with that certificate, would be that in their um, maintenance and management plan, that, that, that they've got a replacement in there. Now, whether that gets enforced, because in 50 years, I, I'm not going to be here. I'm not in the council, I'm not going to be on planet Earth. Um, but that's what I would recommend. What we've got with, with concrete tanks is at least you've got a void that you can put a camera down and inspect. Uh, and just like any other structure, um, you know, you can build into the, uh, a, um, not just the maintenance of clearing out seals and things like that, but maybe an inspection every 10 years for a structure, which, which will be in accordance with our, um, our, our structures, guys, when we've got um, bridges and things underneath, underneath, high, underneath highways, etc. Uh, we can put that in, and if there is any defects and things like that that, that, that that have to be put right, in terms of can I guarantee that that's going to last uh, 100 years, well many houses do many concrete products do um, they've been going in since then, the mid 90s of these attenuation tanks before then it was a case of getting rid of water quickly and you know we've had 200 years of that and we're paying the price for it now because it was the wrong thing to do and they've only, only realised it relatively recently um, York's Water have been taking that, those on for, for since, since the mid 90s um, in my experience, having worked in the industry, uh, and, 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 and Haig Huddleston, who were, who were the drainage engineers, and that were a very experienced uh, local company, I've never known one of these fail. That's not to say that you might not have an instance where there's a peculiar event that something might fail. Um, Yacht, when we do this management company, we have a break clause in it that, that the day it's adopted by Yorkshire Water, then that management company's activities and obligations cease because he actually wants to seem to be a reasonable company. So we, that's as best I can answer that, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for answering that. Before, Nick, before I bring you in, can, can we hear from the legal officer? Thank you, Deb. Thank you. I just wanted to um, explain, you can, you've obviously heard that we've got a very experienced and cautious and uh, um, Lead local flood authority officer who will be assessing the uh, the drainage system that is proposed uh, and which is part of the section 106 agreement I want to talk to how the residence management company uh, works because generally uh, the management company which is set up to manage the ongoing drainage <coughs> is a residence management company and generally what happens is that every person who buys a, a property on this development uh, becomes a member of this management company and um, they are required to pay a contribution to the management company, a sink fund, so to speak, not, no pun intended, um, and that covers ongoing management and replacement, as, as Paul has outlined. So um, generally that is how people buy properties on this 
particular development site and it's in everyone's interest to become a member of the management company to pay a small contribution each year which is assessed generally on by experienced people who know what the system is and, and how long it's likely to last and how, what ongoing um, maintenance costs will be and um, that is the position in the in the event that uh, Yorkshire Water doesn't adopt the system so it's the Kirkley safeguard and it's one that we find works very well. Thank you. Um, Nick, is there any further comments? Um, members raised around the, the, the parking and I think the width of, of the road somebody said. Yes, yeah, and through you, Chair, I'd invite Ryan Kinder from the Highways Authority to, to jump in on that point. Through you, Chair. I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Um, with regards to the parking provision, this is in line with the Council's Highway Design Guide, which summarises as two spaces for three bed units, three spaces for four bed unit plus, and the visitor parking is at a ratio of one per four dwellings, which is achieved with this development. Uh, with regards to the ten dwellings proposed on Lingars Road, um, each one has a, a small private courtyard which serves two units, and this can also accommodate a visitor's parking bay which will be off the highway. Um, on to Lingards Road itself, uh, this is to be widened in the vicinity of the site access to accommodate existing on-street parking. Um, now, there are a number of existing dwellings currently served off Lingard Road opposite the site, and these are ad adequately accessed and aggressed without any known issues. It is therefore considered that the proposed units can be accessed uh, via Lingard Road in the same manner. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Nick? Thank you, Chair. So I'll just jump on to the affordable housing there. Uh, in response to your points. Uh, in the first point of view, you, you questioned about all elderly or young families. In this case, we wouldn't be kind of targeting anyone. It's, it's open for anyone who is on the housing register and goes through that process. Uh, you mentioned concerns of clustering, and yes, by nature, because these are, are flats, they have kind of grouped together. Ultimately, there's only eight units here, so we wouldn't particularly view that as, as an unreasonable amount to put in one place, although, yes, in theory, they could be spread through more of the site. But ultimately, registered providers do have operational requirements to have them as close as possible within reason. Um, in terms of amenity standards, all of them do comply with the nationally described space standards in terms of floor space. Uh, there is no recreation ground on this site. When we come to sites of this size, we try not to have each and every one having its own recreation ground. Uh, this site is within 720 metres of a, a local smaller recreation ground, which some of the public open space contribution would go towards. Um, so, again, we don't try and put one on each site. Uh, in terms of the windows, yes, there is one unit that does, unfortunately, have a second bedroom with a limited outlook. Ultimately, it, it is a matter of the planning balance and... I'm sorry to cite it again, the levels of the site do mean that in some cases, well, well throughout the site, they've done good in, in making sure all the windows have an outlook other than this one. It's the narrow part of the site. It's where the highway has to be. Originally, the highway was closer to number 45, but to make sure it didn't, uh, wasn't too close to them, it's been moved away. So on the planning balance, one window on the second bedroom and one flat, we're willing to accept that. So I think that's everything I'd have to say on the affordable housing. Oh, apologies. In, in terms of the type of them, I'll just get the comments from Strategic Housing back up. So, yeah, in Kirkley's Rural West, uh, in terms of home occupiers, there's 75% of properties are owner-occupied, which is uh, above the typical. Around 15% are private rented and 10% are affordable housing. In discussion with affordable housing, the Strategic Housing Group, we feel that affordable to rent units... Uh, that will be kept in perpetuity is specifically what is needed in this area, but then I would cite back to we can't specify which group would occupy them. So, as put in the report, we feel that this is the best. Instead of houses for sale, there's already a lot of home ownership in the area. It's, it's rented what's needed in this area. Thanks, Nick. Councillor Greaves? Yeah, the, the outstanding question is about unit type mix, as in they're all one and two bedrooms. And I understand it policy is about having a 20% of unit types. Correct again, but it, it is that interpretation of what is needed within the area. And again, the, the strategic housing advice was that there is a significant need for affordable one and two beds uh, in the Kirklees rural area as opposed to larger ones. So it's, it's again the, responding to the demand in that area. Thank you, Nick. Um, we, I think. 
Um, yeah, the screening, the screen on the fence, number 45, I think. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, through you. Ultimately, the screening, it's not unusual for extra screening to be conditioned as part of this, and the amenity of the resident has been considered throughout the proposal. Again, it, it is that planning balance, and we've gone through the reasoning for why the access has to be here. As soon as you start pushing that access higher up the road, it gets higher and higher, the entire site gets higher. Uh, so having it in that location is, in our view, a, a necessity without prejudicing further development and putting the heights everywhere else where ultimately it's, it's um, a side elevation. Yes, it has a garage, but we managed to preserve the rear amenity, the rear windows, the rear garden space through ensuring the road is further away and lower. Ultimately, is a judgment call of the decision maker how you weigh these considerations. There is some level of harm. On balance, officers do not consider it to be material or worthy of, of a refusal, uh, and that is our recommendation to you. Like I say, we would look to ensure screening so that residents, uh, people walking on that path, aren't overlooking. Uh, to be planting to make it as pleasantly uh, an outlook as possible. It will bring a taller structure closer to the, to the view of that conservatory. But on balance, for the reasons given, we don't consider that a justifiable reason for refusal. Thank you, Nick. Councillor Greaves? I think there will be. Apologies, can you repeat that, Councillor? Sorry, um, which of the conditions covers the screening for number five? Huh? It, it was, there was a, a generic boundary condition included in the main report, and then in the update it was specifically amended to refer to reference to that, the number being six. Uh, four and six is the landscaping and boundary details. Sorry. There was one other query that I'd raised, which was uh, regarding the active travel route into Slathway, that it's a, um, uh, on a zebra crossing, as to whether that could be upgraded to a puffin at the expense of the developers. It'd be nice to hear from the highways officer on that point. Thank you, Councillor Greaves. Uh, Ryan? Through you, Chair. Uh, the Council's Highway Safety Team have been consulted as part of this process and they've advised that no upgrade to the existing zebra crossing is justified on this occasion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Um, thank you, everybody, for your, for your comments. I think it's been a really, really good debate. Um, we've had a mover and a seconder for uh, to approve... Sorry. Uh, can... Yep. I'd just like to say, to close it, will it be a local developer, SDOs, the site could have been a site worse, that's for sure. If it been anybody other than this gentleman, it could have been a site worse, that's for absolutely sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Firth. Um, so we have a mover and a seconder uh, to approve uh, the officer's uh, recommendation. I think, I think we move to the vote. Okay. Richard? All right, so we're moving to the vote. You don't have to touch your microphones. It'll come on automatically. Uh, so this <coughs> has been moved by Councillor Homewood. It's seconded by Councillor Sockhole. It's for the recommendation uh, outlined in the report and also, obviously, the additional uh, draft uh, conditions in the, in the update. Um, so I'll start with Councillor McGuinn. Against. Councillor Firth? Four. Councillor McGrath? Four. Councillor Marchington? Four. Councillor Lee Richards? Against. Councillor Greaves? Against. Councillor Sokol? Per. Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Hawkins? Four. Councillor Homewood? Four. Councillor Lawson? Four. Councillor Alla. Four. Okay, so uh, that's carried. Thank you. Recommendation is approved. Recommendation is approved. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. We'll move to the second application, um, page number 69. Thank you. Ellie. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. My name is Ellie Worth and I am the case officer for this application. The application relates to land at Manor Street in Newsome and is for the erection of 10 student residential units with associated landscaping. The application has been brought to committee at the request of Councillor Cooper due to concerns over the right of way, parking, waste and privacy. Full comments can be found within the committee report. Here is the location plan and an aerial photo. As you can see, the site occupies a corner plot, so it's here on this aerial, and obviously you can see the red line there, um, and is laid in grass. The site is currently, well, the site is unallocated on the Kirklees local plan. Here are the elevations. The building would be two-storey in height with accommodation within the roof space. The building would be an L-shaped but would broadly be in line with 30 Manor Street and 21 Bell Street. It would also have two acted frontages along both street scenes. Dormer windows are proposed within the eaves and that's to create the um, accommodation within the roof space. Here are the floor plans. As mentioned, there would be 10 units and each would have a bedroom, WC and kitchenette. There would be four units on the ground floor, four units on the first floor and two units at second floor within the roof as seen. Here are some photos of the site. These are taken from Bell Street. As you can see, there is a change in levels within the site and within the wider area. The land falls from north from south, sorry, to north. Here are some photos taken from Manor Street, and this just further shows the context of the site and the relationships um, in which, the, well, which is in the area. Here are just some final photos to show the plot within the wider context. The area is predominantly residential and is characterised by terrace and semi-detached dwellings, which are all two-storey in height. Here is, a, here is the proposed site plan. This shows the building in the context of the site with some amenity space to be provided for the occupants. The site will be lined with trees along its frontages. There will also be a bin and cycle store within the site. In terms of the principle of de development, the site, as previously mentioned, is unallocated and is in the catchment area for students attending the university. The site has received previous permission in 20, well, 2018, but the application was 2017 reference, um, for the same type of development. However, this was never implemented. This can be considered a material planning consideration. In terms of design and layout, officers consider a two-storey building in this location to be acceptable. Gable roofs are also common within the street scene. Fenestration would be in keeping with neighbouring properties with there also being evidence of front dormers within the wider vicinity. Materials, as mentioned, would be natural stone with concrete tiles to the roof. The design of the building would also mirror that of the previous consent, so nothing is to have changed other than just a slight tweak to the location of the um, bin store. In terms of residential amenity, a full assessment can be found within paragraphs 10.32 to 10.42 of the committee report. Nonetheless, it is important to note to members that there would be some impact, especially on number 30. That's this property here, and as you will have seen out on site today, with regards to overshadowing. This is due to this property being due north of the application site. However, the scheme has been designed in order to mitigate some of the impact uh, by reducing the scale and massive to, uh, to single storey when adjacent to these neighbours' outdoor amenity space. So this would be the single storey aspect here. The remainder of the two store, the bulk amassing from the two storey would be adjacent to number 30's blank uh, gable elevation. Therefore, on balance, officers have concluded that the impact on number 30 is acceptable, having afforded weight to the previous permission. In terms of highway safety, the development would be car free given its sustainable location and easy access to public transport links. A cycle store is also proposed on the plan and this is considered acceptable by highways officers. If approved, this application would also secure via 106 a contribution of £5,115 towards improving sustainable, sustainable modes of transport within the area. 
With regards to drainage, a connection will be made into an existing water course for surface water. A condition is also recommended to explain how the site would be developed in terms of separate drainage systems, and this would be pre-commencement. The scheme aims to get 10% net biodiversity net gain, and this would be also secured via a condition for an ecological design strategy. There has been some questions slash concerns raised regarding a right of way to the west of the site, which is shown here on the plans. Um, having consulted with the PROW, the Council's PROW team, they have noted that this is not a formal public right of way, but it has been there for a substantial amount of a substantial amount of time. Therefore, anyone could submit an application to claim this as one. However, for the purpose of this application, any concerns regarding private rights of access would be a private legal matter outside the realms of this planning application. However, for, for transparency, the agent has confirmed that they do own all of the land within the red line boundary and have left a pedestrian access for easement. So this, as pointed out, is there. Six representations have been received in objection to the application, and these have been assessed and addressed thoroughly within the committee report. As such, officers are recommending an on-balance approval for the application. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ellie. Uh, first speaker, yes. we've got uh, Councillor Andrew Cooper. <coughs> uh, thank you, and thank you to officers for the, the work that they've done uh, on, on the report. Um, I, I do... Um, uh, I, I see the uh, the access to the rear near um, the, to the side. Um, it does look like encroachment on the um, on the existing uh, access down the, the rear. But um, uh, you've done your work, and I don't think there's any way that, in planning terms, I can contest it. But it does does seem rather odd that they've taken over a large section of that access uh, access there. Um, so on, on the uh, application itself, one of the issues we really have uh, in uh, the news and ward around there is a lot of student housing and there's a lot of waste management issues that, that come from um, c come from people who are having a household for the very first time. And so the waste management plan that we've asked for is, is really important to us, to show us that every year that new students come in to the property, that there is, uh, there, there is some work done to actually make sure that those households um, are, are explained about how to manage their waste in their properties, because we end up as local councillors being the ones uh, to picking up those, those issues. So if we can see that waste management plan uh, uh, that I'd be I'd really appreciate that uh, one of the things that's uh, come up here is the issue of parking there are 10 households uh, that are going to be here 10, 10 people uh, and that would mean potentially 10 cars one of the great things is it's been you've told told us it's a car free development so one of the things that I would like as a condition of this application is that uh, that these households won't be eligible for permit parking and that we make that uh, we make that uh, one of the conditions here, and that we inform the parking office that because it's a car-free development, there will be no applications for permit parking. Can we add that to the recommendations? Thank you. Uh, so we've got uh, Tom Edwards. Thank you, Chair. Um, as previously been stated, this um, site has been had prior approval for essentially the same uh, development. Um, that did lapse, but we're, uh, it's been resubmitted, and, and the client has fully engaged with the with the planning team to uh, deal with any issues that have been raised. Um, the ecology uh, gave a net biodiversity gain um, dealing with this um, public right of way that although isn't an official public right of way the, the client has uh, quite rightly included that as a um, to retain to be retained um, I think the, the design of the of the development um, is in keeping with the with the area its massings kept down below the, the ridge level of uh, number uh, 27 on, on Bell Street and it's, uh, I think everything that, that can be done has been done in order to uh, satisfy, satisfy planning that it's, uh, 
it should be approved. Um, the developer is a, a very responsible local developer, landlord, um, uses local local tradesmen. Um, so it's just all, in my eyes, it's all, all pointing towards a sustainable development. So I think there's not much more to say. Right? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Edwards, um, for for your comments. Um, over to the committee for, for their comments, Councillor Sokol and then Councillor Richards. Thank you, Chair. I think it's a well designed this scheme for ten students for us. Yeah. I've been on the site busy this morning and I found the main objection was from local council about the footpath. I think the officer have pointed out the footpath on the by the side of number 21 and Bell Street, not 27, as uh, someone has said. And they will be retained and the, and the waste bin, they, they have been uh, moved to some other place. And uh, this site has been, applicant had the previous pro, uh, approval, I think, 2019 or three days left. I think a revised application is even better than before, which has been approved some time ago. So I don't think so there is a need any car parking because it, uh, even if we see the nearby university student flat all building, they are not providing any car parking there. I think there is no need for car parking. I don't think that it's a cl very close to the university. I don't think the student need any cars to go to universities. We got a uh, trans uh, what they call uh, contribution for metro, yeah, for five thousand. So. I have no problem to move the official recommendation to approve application, Mr. Chair. Sorry, uh, thank you, Councillor Sokol. Um, Councillor Lee Richards. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I know this site very well. Um, it would be happy to see it um, used. It's, it's a bit of an eyesore at times in terms of fly tipping. The only two concerns are. A, the loss of access down the side. I understand it isn't a, a public right of way, but um, access for emergency vehicles, perhaps. And secondly, this obviously is a residential area, lots of families, and it would it would be um, good to see um, no no permit parking allowed for the student accommodation, as it's already quite um, quite well parked up with local families living in the area. That's my only two concerns, really. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hawkins. Um, thank you. Um, very familiar with this sort of student accommodation. There's, there's a little bit in, in my ward and considerable about in Councillor Coopers and Lee Richards' ward. I should know my, my partner's one of them in, in living in accommodation like this. Um, I think while I understand uh, Councillor Cooper's point about you know, 10, 10 people, uh, 10 students living, uh, in that the, the likelihood of that being 10 vehicles is unlikely. But I, I share the view of uh, hoping for the best but planning for the worst, and uh, I, I too would be open to potentially the condition of the no permit park, and I'd be interested to hear the officers' uh, views on that, but that is something I would be open to supporting as well. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Davis. Yep, thanks, Chair. Um, yep, g good to see... Um, Good quality uh, accommodation for students. Uh, I think we all know that you know, so, some accommodation is uh, is not up to this standard uh, as such. Um, and um, I think, as Councillor Sokol said, you know, accommodation that's well within easy walking distance to the university. So, you know, clearly there, there shouldn't be a need for for vehicles. And um, being really old, I certainly, you know, when I was a student, nobody had a car, but obviously that's changed now. So I do agree, we have to be careful that we don't get into a situation with permits uh, being given. So I think that's clearly something to be good to hear officer's uh, viewpoint on. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to second uh, the, the nomination, and uh, nomination, recommendation <laughs> as well. 
Uh, thank you, Councillor Davis. So we have a mover and a seconder for the application uh, to approved. Before I go there, Councillor. Yeah, I, I think Councillor Sully Richards and Councillor Hawkins have covered. Is it legal to condition, put that condition on? We, we, we need the. We need it. If we can do, we, I'd like to see it done. Um, Thank you, Councillor McGuinn. We will bring the officers in in a minute of whether it's legal or not. Um, Councillor Homewood, then. Sorry, very quickly, because probably should just let the officer answer the question. But yeah, I just I just found in the report the parking thing a little bit confusing because when it gets to the parking concerns bit, it just says, "As we're not creating any parking spaces, this won't be a problem," which doesn't seem logical. It seems the opposite way around. So if so, unless we're yeah, so unless we ask saying it's all permit parking and there will be no permit parking offered. I can, it surely will cause a problem, if, even if it's only one or two people. So, yeah, I just wanted clarity on that. And also, just on the um, public transport stuff, um, is that money for a particular thing? Is it for the Metro cards or is it for some other contribution? Because I suppose we'll have, you know, it'll probably be on an annual cycle, won't it, if students, different students living in that accommodation. Cheers. Uh, thank you. I think um, we'll go to the officers um, for, for, for the legal clarity on the permit parking stuff. And then Alia. Um, on the condition point about conditioning, no, we can't do that. It won't make, meet the legal tests. But there, <clears throat> there will be ways and means of. No, we can't. We, we can't condition. You shall not have uh, parking permits here. But there are ways and means of doing it in the same way that we've got a waste management plan. There'll be some. We'll be able to engage with the uh, management of this particular unit so that. Um, parking is not permitted by students. Obviously, if there's a disabled student who needs a parking space, that's different, but we can't condition it, but we'll be able to manage it. Uh, I, I'd just like a bit of clarification, really, about how you manage it um, in terms of the parking, the parking permit side of thing. Perking, yeah. Um, okay. Um, and just how, how that might actually happen. Would it, how might we actually um, reduce the, the, the... I mean, if we're not going to condition um, no per parking permits, how are we going to manage it so, they, so that students uh, don't have parking permits? Because it's a car-free development. Through you, Chair. Um, the, the Council does have a permit parking policy. Um, now, I'm led to believe that the um, permits aren't issued to student uh, accommodation developments, so there won't be any permits issued to this, this development. Um, and just to touch on the, the car free aspect, uh, you've got to consider that, the, as you're probably aware, there's, there's numerous other student accommodation. Uh, in and around this area and the university that don't have any parking provision either. Um, and this, these have been approved and this is of a similar nature, so it's considered acceptable from a highways perspective. Thank you. But no, no, no I'm, unfortunately, Councillor Cooper, I think I've, I've, I've been okay. I don't usually allow questions in, in that fashion, but it's come across uh, and, and the officers have answered it and I think it's been detailed in the report and it's been discussed previously. I've allowed that that question is, as just a, a pass, you don't usually do it. Councillor Greaves. Yeah. So th that's fine if it's students, but there is no specification that it's only students who can occupy these properties, is there? It, it could effectively be, be beds. Mm -hmm. Was it students only? Full time. So, oh, all right. Okay, fine. Thank you, uh, everybody. I think we have a mover and a seconder for uh, to approve the. Um, Officer's recommendation. Sorry, is there one more question? So yeah, could we just have a, a thing about the, the access for emergency vehicles? Just a response to that. Through you, Chair. So, yeah, just in terms of that, I guess the applicant has shown that the land within their, the, the red line boundary is within their ownership. Obviously, in terms of private legal mass in terms of access down the side of that, that would be kind of a, a separate legal matter. So I don't think we would be able to get into that under this planning application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Um, any more speakers? 
Okay, so we have a mover and a seconder to approve the, app, uh, the officer's uh, recommendation. I think we'll go to the vote, Richard. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So it's been moved by Councillor Sokol, seconded by Councillor Davis for the recommendation to approve as detailed in the submitted report. Um, so Councillor McGuinn? Four. Councillor Firth? Four. Councillor McGrath? Councillor Lee Richards? Councillor Greaves? Councillor Socko? Four. Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Hawkins? Four. Councillor Homewood? Four. Councillor Lawson? Against. Councillor Alla? Four. Okay, so that application has been approved. Thank you.
everybody, welcome back. Next application is um, at Cecil Street, page 93. John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so my name is John Holmes, and I'm the presenting officer for this case uh, on behalf of Sam Jackman. Uh, members have been asked to consider an application for the erection of a rear dormer. Uh, this slide shows the site outlined in red. Excuse me. Uh, this slide shows the proposed elevations, um, and you can see the front and the sides of the dormer here. There's a front and these are the two sides. Uh, there's an existing two-storey extension already on the rear of the property, which is shown here. This is a floor plan. It shows the additional floor space that would be created, creating this bedroom three. Uh, the, there is a previous refusal at the application site, and this is the scheme which was refused. Uh, this was refused on the 5th of August last year. Uh, so this photo shows the front of the property and wider street scene. And this shows the rear of the property. Uh, you can see it down with a slight red X on it here. And this is an aerial photograph of the site. Uh, so the site is within Springwood Conservation Area, as identified within Kirkley's local plan. No representations have been received in relation to the application. The Council's conservation team were consulted regarding the previously refused proposal and recommended refusal. Uh, these comments are considered to be equally relevant to the consideration of this case. The key issue for consideration is the impact upon the conservation area, visual amenity upon the locality and whether the proposal is acceptable in principle. The proposal is not considered to have significant impacts upon residential amenity, highway safety or in respect of any other matters. The design, scale and materials of the proposal are not considered to preserve or enhance the character of the conservation area. The dormer would be clad with composite cladding, which is a synthetic alternative to timber. And uh, this material is also not considered to be acceptable within the conservation area, uh, taken into account as well as the size and scale of the proposal, which would encompass almost all of the rear roof slope. The formation of a flat roof dome extension is considered to cause harm to the significance of the Springwood conservation area and is not considered to be acceptable in terms of visual amenity. Therefore, the recommendation is refusal for the reason as set out within the case officer report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, yes, we've got Councillor Cooper. Okay, I, I referred to this to committee because I, I thought it was really something where it, it really required um, judgment and um, and for it to have a wider um, uh, people to have a wider look at it. Uh, and the question before us today is: Would it really cause significant harm to the conservation area uh, uh, of Highfields? Now, if you look at those back, um, could you put the back uh, the back up again uh, of that? So we're not talking the frontage of the property, we're talking back Cecil Street. Uh, no, I was thinking about the pictures of the existing rear. Now, that's the beauty of, uh, of the conservation area of Highfields. Uh, it, it's not exactly Venice, is it? Uh, and, and so we, we're, the, the, the thing which makes the conservation area of value in the area is not the rears. It's the frontages, it's those areas, it's those places. And, and if you actually look at it, they've developed over time. If you look at some of those extensions uh, that, are, that are there, those are things which have come over time which are not things of beauty. They're, they're not things which, which give it, um, which help the character in any way whatsoever. Now, the applicant um, has actually diminished, and it's only a very small um, extension away from the roof line. Uh, and so it's not, in, in many ways, very significant. There are no objections to this application from neighbours. No neighbours are, are, are opposed to this. It, it's just, if you like, because it happens to be in a line in the map, which includes a conservation area. But nobody is going to go to the rear of those properties and go, this is a thing of beauty. What, what have they done to ruin the, the, the back Cecil Street to make it a, a, a less um, a, attractive area? 
So um, we, there are a variety of roof designs already on the site. So nothing, as, nothing essentially will be lost as a result of proving this application. What it will mean is that, that there'll be a greater amenity for the people living there and it will make their lives easier for, for no visual impact at all on, on things which people actually value and care about. So it's not overlooking uh, anyone to any great degree, which is another reason why, why there's no objections. Uh, and so I, 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 I'm calling on here for councillors' judgment on this to recognise um, that uh, we shouldn't be bound by simply the line on the map, but actually think about the impact on, on people and the benefit to them of this extension. So please uh, recommend acceptance of this application and turn down uh, the officer's recommendation to refuse. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Um, no further speakers. Okay. So it's over. Can, can I just ask, uh, Mr Chair, the extension that's currently there that comes out of the rear, when was that? Do we know when that was passed? And, and as on what, on what grounds against the conservation area was that allowed? Okay, they will gather that information. Um, Councillor Davis and then Councillor Homewood. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll wait for that information. I, I think officers put a fairly clear, clear picture forward here in terms of the issues around the conservation area, and obviously we went today to, to visit as well. Um, I think as well, certainly, you know, uh, I find uh, some important information around 5-1, uh, the history of negotiations, but we talked about the previous application was refused. And this application was submitted without pre-application discussion, which I find strange, because surely in that situation I would have expected to have that pre-application discussion. And further than that, um, it would appear that officers, from this information, have suggested a potentially acceptable design suggestion, which I assume wasn't taken on board by the applicant. Um, and also reference appeal decision for similar uh, rear dormers within a, uh, a conservation area which was refused and thereafter dismissed. So, so I, th I think those, area, those few bits of information add to the information the officers talked about. The fact that uh, there's, there's not, I know there's not, nothing to force people to engage, but I would have thought it would have been sensible to engage, particularly if there's potentially an acceptable design suggestion that was being put forward. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that from officers as to what that design suggestion was uh, and what conversations uh, took place with regards to that so that we can understand uh, the sort of dynamics, if you like, around that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Holmwood. Yeah, some similar comments, to be honest. I, I think my concern is that I understand there's a certain amount of... Um, Subjectivity, and we have to look at each case in each um, conservation area. But I do have a bit of a concern that we say, "Oh, this is fine, fine here." We've got no consistency, and then a very similar one in another area. Oh, well, actually, no, we feel that does does impact. And I think we get these questions quite a lot. You know, well, I've got a listed building. Actually, why should I have to do this? Why should I have to do that? I know it's different here, but um, I'm just concerned about kind of going away from the officer advice when they look at these very regularly across the whole district and what, what constitutes the harm and, and try to um, intervene there, particularly when we've already had the same, what appears to be essentially the, the same application refused. Now, it doesn't appear that the applicants appealed that decision. Um, and then, like you said, I was, the question I was going to ask is what, what would be suitable? So are we saying that it's, were the alternatives also a, a dorm or was it, some, was it something else or... Because um, I suppose the other option, I don't think the applicant's here, but I suppose the other option would be for us just to defer this and let the applicant actually have some discussions with them, but it appears that's not um, something they want to do. So, yeah, I'm, same as Councillor Davies, just a bit of information on what that alternative was. Thank you, Councillor Homewood. Uh, Councillor Hawkins. Um, thank you, Chair, and I, I appreciate, again, Councillor Cooper's uh, comments, but I, I think when you're dealing with a conservation, you've got to be incredibly careful from a, from a planning point of view what you're... Um, what is being proposed and what is implemented. As, as James said, while it is difficult for us to achieve um, consistency through this committee, it's, it's something we've got to always strive for, I think. And um, 
Council McGrath before mentioned the sort of extension that's taken place there, but as you can see from the surrounding area, there's lots of that have lots of the homes there have that sort of extension out there. There's no other uh, house there with the dormer protruding out of it. Um, so yeah, similar to my, my colleagues, I'd be interested to know uh, if there can be a discussion that takes place with the developer. That would be something I'd encourage the, the developer to engage with, the property owner to engage with, um, because yeah, I think there is something that could be accommodated here. But again, this is near identical to the application that was rejected previously. It's this is not it, in my view. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins, Councillor McGuinn. Yeah, uh, Councillor Cooper's got a point about the. <laughs> the beauty and, des and design of, the, of Back Cecil Street. Also, w I looked around the other side of Back Cecil Street and there were three curious extensions which really didn't fit in, could be said to not fit in with the street scene. So there's, there is a, already an inconsistency there because the Back Cecil Street, there was two extensions, basically what, like what the gentleman wanted and another strange extension almost straight across from him, which didn't make any sense at all. So, again, again, I think we need to, is it possible to defer it so they can get together to, to I can, can, we move, can I move a deferral so they can get together with the officers to see if there's any sort of compromise could be reached? And I, I, I take, uh, take, the, take the point from oh, Council Hawkins about consistency. So, but there's already an inconsistency on that, on that street. <laughs> and these are back houses as well. Okay. Thank you, Councillor McGuinn. Um, jo John? Yeah, um, I, I mean, essentially, discussions have taken place already. We'd be deferring to repeat a process that we've already be, has already been undertaken. Sam's gone back to the applicant. She's set out a possible um, solution, which would be very small, traditional style um, dormers. So, yeah, pitch roof. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Um, one point as well is in the locality, there is clearly roof space conversions using roof lights. So this, the, the option has been put forward to the applicant. Um, they've, they've wanted to progress this scheme, and I think that's what the decision they want is making on essentially. Uh, thank you, John. Councillor Davis. I, th I think on the basis of what I've just heard, I'm prepared to move the officer's recommendation uh, on this. Okay, we have a mover and a seconder, moved by Paul Davis, second by Councillor Tyler Hawkins. Any further comments? Okay, I think we'll go to the vote, Richard. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> it's been uh, moved by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Hawkins, to re re refuse the application for the reasons outlined in the submitted report. So if I go to Councillor McGuinn. Abstain. Councillor Firth. Yes. Abstain. Abstain. Um, Councillor Graves. Refuse. Sorry, re against. against. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This. So. The, so. Just to confirm, we're we're voting on the refusal of the application. So if I said against, would that be against? Against. 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 Sorry, can I just... Can we start again, because I'm confused now. OK, so we'll, we're going to go back round. Just if so, so we're voting on to re refusal to refuse. Right, so Councillor McGuinn. Uh, still abstain. OK, Councillor Firth. Yes. Abstain. OK, so Councillor Greaves for refusal. Councillor Stockholm. Park. Councillor Davis. Four. Four. Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Hanwood. Four. Four, yeah. Councillor Lawson. Four. And Councillor Arla. Four. Okay, so that application has been refused in line with the reasons outlined in the submitted report.
Okay, then, everybody, the next application is the erection first floor extension above the existing garage 29 Oldfield Road, Honley, um, page 105. Is it Katie? Yeah, Katie. Thank you, Chair. My name is Katie Chu, the case officer for application 2022-93846. This is for the erection of a first floor extension above an existing garage at 29 Oldfield Road in Honley. The application has been brought before Huddersfield Subcommittee at the request of Councillor Greaves, who would like the committee to consider if the extension would be appropriate development in the green belt and whether it would cause harm to the visual amenity of the area or the amenity of neighbours. This is the application site here. Um, as you can see, there's residential dwellings located to both the east and west, and it's open countryside to the north and south. The site is located within the Green Belt, it's within a battle area, Home Valley Neighbourhood Development Plan area, and it's partly within the Strategic Green Infrastructure Network. We have received one representation and objections to the proposals. Many of the concerns related did um, relate to a number of civil matters, which would unfortunately fall outside the remit of planning. This has been addressed within the committee report. Other issues included concerns of overlooking and the proposed appearance of bearing in nature. So this is just an original site plan that I could find. This is the oldest and clearest plan I could find on our system, which dates back to 1955. And this is the dwelling as, as it would have been built. As you can see, when comparing to the proposed plan, there's quite a lot of space around the property. It's got a smaller footprint. Um, on the proposed plan, you can see the extensions and additions that have been undertaken over the years. So you've got a two-storey side extension here, a porch to the front. There's also this application on the left-hand side, and then we've got a rear extension, which is currently um, being implemented at the moment. So I've actually provided some visuals of what the originally built dwelling would have looked like and compared them against the proposed elevations. So this includes the extensions that already exist, which is to the left here, the porch, and then there's also the rear extension. Part of this garage does form um, of an, an previously approved extension, uh, but the application we're focused on is this extension above the garage here. There will also be a one metre separation distance from the boundary um, proposed in this application. So as you can see, the original dwelling as built was somewhat simple and linear, it, but now it appears contrived as a complicated form and design. This is further supported by the proposed side elevations. So this is how the property would have existed originally. We then got permission to put a pitch roof over the garage. As you can see, the two-storey side extension, the front porch, there would be um, a single-storey rear extension, but this hasn't been built out yet. And then our application here, which seeks to put the first floor extension above the garage. Uh, looking at the floor plans of the dwelling, I've outlined what the original dwelling would have probably been um, in orange, and that equates to around 137 square metres with a volume of approximately 846 cubic metres. Again, you can see how much development has taken place since the building was originally constructed. Our application relates to this element here, and that has a floor area of approximately 54 square metres and a volume of around 184 cubic metres. Looking at this cumulatively, um, the, the original dwelling is, oh sorry, there's a drastic increase overall equating to around 220% increase the floor area and 103% increase in volume. From a visual perspective, the two-storey additions to the front of the dwelling when viewed cumulatively would be greater in width than the original front wall of the dwelling. The two bulky gables to either side of the original dwelling would also significantly complicate the form and would compete in prominence, resulting in the character and design of the host property being lost. Taking a look at... Oh, sorry, it skipped one. Oh, we're missing the planning history. Sorry, there is some planning history. I'll just quickly run through it. So we've had a number of applications that are similar on this site that have previously been refused. We had one in September 2022, which is the exact same scheme as what we have here today. Um, this was refused on similar reasons for refusal as what we have today as well. Um, in May, there was an application also refused, but that didn't include the one metre setback from the neighbouring property. Um, there's also been a prior approval for the enlargement of Dwelling House, um, which added an additional story to the original property, and that was refused in February 2022. So looking at the front elevation, 
here you can see where the original dwelling would have been. You've got the porch, two-story side extension, and I'll show you. So this is what would have originally been on the dwelling, but it would have had a flat roof rather than a pitch. So this is an addition, and this is where the proposed extension is going to go, but there will be a one-metre separation distance from this boundary. Looking in this corner here, you can see the relationship with the neighbouring property number 31 Old Fill Road. This area would be infilled and then obviously built upon the first floor extension. I previously mentioned a single story rear extension, which would be here. So when you look in the officer's report, we had some um, concerns in terms of the impact on number 31 Oldfield Road. And this is due to the relationship the proposed extension would have. Um, the proposal is considered to be overbearing and overly dominant on both the rear habitable room windows and the amenity space to the rear with the proposals not meeting the 45 degree guideline as outlined within the SBD. There are also significant concerns in respect to loss of light and outlook. Finally, just some more rear elevation photos. This, elevation, uh, this photo just shows how open the site is. And this rear elevation shows the original dwelling and then this additional two-storey side extension and where the proposed rear extension would be. To conclude, officers are recommending refusal of the application with three reasons for refusal. These are that the proposed extension, when viewed cumulative, cumulatively with existing additions, would result in a disproportionate addition to the original dwelling and therefore would constitute inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. The development would also have a detrimental impact upon spatial and visual openness of the green belt, whereby no very special circumstances have been provided to outweigh the identified harm. The second reason relates to the extension's large scale, massing form and relationship with the host dwelling when taking into account previous extensions and additions. The proposals are not considered to represent a subservient addition to the dwelling, introducing in Congress an overly dominant feature which detracts from the original dwelling house. Finally, due to the scale of the proposed extension and its proximity to adjacent neighbouring property, number 31 Oldfield Road, officers conclude that the proposals will result in undue overshadowing and have an overbearing impact on rear windows and the amenity space of this neighbouring dwelling, as well as undue loss of light and outlook to the rear windows, resulting in poor residential amenity. The proposals are therefore not considered to accord with both national and local planning policy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, we've got um, Phil Fletcher. Chairman, members of the committee, I represent the applicant. Our submission is based on an additional story above the existing garage. Number 29 is a detached dwelling constructed of local stone below a tiled roof. The current submission was born from negotiations with neighbours to appease their original concerns. Our current submission sets back the proposed first floor from the boundary and allays the objections and concerns of the neighbours. My clients accept that the property is within the green belt and supports the local authority view that the green belt should be protected from development. We submit, however, that although the property is within the green belt, our submission would have no detriment to the green belt. The property is set well back from the highway, well screened from the adjacent road, in its set in large gardens, one would have minimal impact on surroundings. The design mirrors existing details of the property and would be reconstructed of matching facing materials and considered to be subservient to the existing house. Whilst accepting the planners submitted arithmetic relating to volume, we submit that this theory, although factual, is not relevant in this case. There have been several large extensions approved locally and we submit that all applications should be, should be considered on merit, not refused just as a Greenbelt reason. We have a detached house set in a large plot with generous green space to the front and the rear which will all be protected. The existing house footprint will be unaffected. The extension is a first floor above an existing garage. The proposal would have no effect on local wildlife, the protection of Greenbelt would be preserved, and the environment would be protected. We therefore respectfully submit that our application be allowed. Um, Indy, are you wishing to speak? Yes, yeah, so it's Indy Sohal. Hello, Chair. Right, I was hoping the councillors uh, 
would have got the opportunity to go to the site, visit it, uh, to see Oldfield Road is made up of detached, semi-detached, bungalows, cottages and farm buildings. No property is the same, and my extension, we feel, would not be out of character with surrounding properties. You would have seen, if you would have gone today, you would have seen extensions to properties all within green belt restrictions, <laughs> same circumstances to what I'm seeking approval of. Whilst we appreciate green belt restrictions, uh, a, a central policy is promoting home extension with reduced planning involvement. Recent policy addition stories of Class AA suggest applicants look towards increased height rather than footprint. We are following this principle with the application in developing above the garage, not increasing footprint. Our original application, Class AA, fitted all the criteria, but the council did not like the design because of the second floor extension. So we have now gone for the second floor extension above the garage. Now, on our road, all these all these uh, applications have been approved. Old min Minstrel, two-storey extension. Number 47, first floor and side extension. Number 27, two-storey side extension. Number 25, two-storey extension. Medina, two-storey extension and rear extension. Carlin Farm, they demolished an outbuilding and erected a, a, a big building there, a detached house. Ivy Cottage, that was demolished and uh, in replace. It was a detached dwelling and a garage. Number 31, two-storey side extension. Stonely side extension. Brackenside, first floor extension. Egantine, first floor extension. Rawdon, first floor extension. Uh, I would like to see consistency and seek approval of my application. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you both. Um, I don't think there's any more speakers. So over to the committee. Councillor Homewood. And then Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thanks, Chair. Obviously, I've not looked at every single... We have not seen every single application in this area, but I think um, my interpretation is when we look at Greenbelt sites, we always look at it in the same way in terms of the calculations and, and, and so on and apply that, apply that policy. And I know it was mentioned by the applicant about other um, extensions on properties in the area. One of those, I, get, I think, is on this property, a, a ground floor extension that's already been granted. So... I think I'm pretty comfortable that there is there is con consistency um, in the way that we do that, um, and, the, and you know even if we don't agree with the um, green belt policy, we're not here to, to change the policies here. We're here to implement them, um, and even if we ignored the green belt policy, there was already two other reasons that the officer gave to to reject the application, including the impact on neighbouring properties. So I, I can't really see any reason to um, diverge from what the officer is recommending. So I, I'd move the officer's recommendation to refuse, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Homewood. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, well, much, much the same as, uh, as Councillor Homewood, really. The, um, it, it was uh, refused for the same reasons the previous time, uh, and, and there's not been a significant change of deviation since the last time this application was refused. I, I would also second uh, the motion to, to move. Thank you. So we have a mover and a seconder. Um, Councillor Sokol. Yeah, uh, Chair, I think the applicant has a, a got the point. It's a bit other property nearby. They got the extension why big enough, bigger than his proposal. I'm not sure because we know site bigger over there, you know. So. If the other property got the extension side and rear, then, and they, if they, those extension not affect the green belt area, so why this property only this extension is affect well affect the green belt policy of the area? Thank you, Councillor Sokol. Um, can I just bring the officer back in um, around the other extensions? Thank you, Chair. As we've already mentioned, obviously we base each application on its own merits. Um, we can only judge what we've got in front of us today, um, and that is what officers have done time and time again at this site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, any further comments? <laughs> 
sorry, could I just ask a question? Because obviously this property has already been extended previously. Um, is there a sort of percentage where, where you've already exhausted your opportunity to extend? If the officers could answer that, please. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your chair. Um, obviously, we don't have a specific percentage. It's based down on visual impact on openness. Obviously, in this case, it's 220%. It's, it's excessive. It's over and above the original dwelling house. Um, so it's just a judgment that we make. And obviously, in this instance, we judged it was too much. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, any, any further comments? Because we have a mover and a seconder for the officer's recommendation for refusal. Um, I think we'll go to the board, okay. Richard. All right, so it's been <coughs> moved by Councillor Homewood, seconded by Councillor Hawkins, and this is a vote to refuse. Councillor McGuinn? Four. Councillor Firth? Four. Councillor McGrath? Against. Councillor Lee Richards? For the refusal, support the officer's recommendation. Councillor Sokol? I abstain, yes. Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Hawkins? Four. Councillor Homeward? Four. Councillor Lawson? Four. Councillor Oller? Four. Okay, so um, that's been passed. So the recommendation to refuse has been approved. Thank you. Um, so the last and final application, outline application for residential development, 47 Style Common Road, page 123. Tom? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Hunt. I am the case officer for this application. To be considered today is an outline plan and application for the erection of residential development at land adjacent to number 47 Stowell Common Road with all matters reserved. There is a full report before members. Details of indicative site access from Stowell Common Road have been provided. This application has been brought to the subcommittee for determination as it has been submitted by an elected member of the council. Members visited the site today, this morning, uh, to be determined is whether the principle of new residential development on the site is acceptable. As set out in the committee report, there has been no representation received for this proposal. The application is recommended for refusal for reasons related to visual and residential amenity. Please see 124 of the committee agenda. For information, an indicative site access has been set out in plans approximately 2.5 metres wide at the furthest point from the junction and where site levels might allow an access point to be formed here. Highway Development Management raised no objection to this indicative access. The host property is prominently elevated above Newsom Road with a conservatory to its side and green screening. The application site is at considerably lower ground level access via stator steps. The application site performed part of the garden and is the prominent feature in the street scene. The ground levels within the application site itself are steeply sloping within a retaining wall, supporting the site along Newsom Road. The elevated site of the, the elevated nature of the site increases its prominence in the, in the street scene. Given the presence of retaining walls adjacent to the highway, highway structures were consulted on the application, although they have raised no objection in principle, this is subject to a number of conditions as set out in the committee report. Recommendation for refusal is for two reasons. Visual immunity, due to its prominent location, shape and site constraints, built development in this site would appear cramped, contrived and incongruous and was fail to sympathetically integrate with the character and appearance of the area.
Second one is residential amenity due to its siting on a prominent, exposed, narrow and steeply sloping site. It would fail to provide an adequate standard of usable, proportionate and private outside amenity space for future occupiers. For these reasons, as indicated within the committee report, the recommendation is to delegate refusal of the application and the issuance of the decision notice to the Head of Planning and Development. Thank you very much for listening. Nothing further to our Chair. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, no speakers on this, so it's straight over to the committee for the main debate. Councillor Hawkins, first. Thank you. Yeah, I'll keep mine short and sweet. I uh, completely agree with the sort of um, officer's um, recommendation on this. I don't see the um, sort of the, the space that's that's there. I've, I've, I appreciate this is just an outline, but I've no idea what they what they're hoping to do in sort of the very limited space they've got there. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd like to propose we uh, uh, move with the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Hawkins, Councillor Davis. Yeah, we're, we're, this is one of the, uh, the applications we, we obviously visited this morning, and, and, and actually, you know, that that sort of exaggerates it. It makes the space look bigger than it is in some respects. But when you look, when you get there and look at the space, you, you can absolutely see, you know, that uh, quite honestly, to develop something on there uh, just doesn't make any sense for the for the reasons the officer has outlined. You know, um, and um, I, I would struggle. To, to see any reason uh, why we would approve this in, even in out, outline fashion. So I, I would second um, uh, uh, Councillor Hawkins as a uh, move, move in of the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Davis, Councillor. So. Chair, I got a different view than my colleagues here. This application, this is outlining, outline application, yeah, and the detailed application. <laughs> Sorry, you. don't make me laugh. Yeah, this is outline application. Yeah, it's not a detailed application. Detail. <laughs> Bill, follow that. Yeah. So, I, I don't think that this is the reason to refuse is because on the prominent uh, uh, prominent corner on the Newgem Road, on the style common, there are some other buildings on the prominent prominent corner. Look on the on near the corner with Park Street and uh, Corn Road. There are tall student building. They are on the prominent, prominent. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to say, yeah. Uh, what I'm going to propose, I think, let us see what the detail application come every every grant the outline application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sokol. Councillor Sully Richards. Thank you, Chair. Um, these two roads, Newsom Road and Stattle Common Road, both very busy roads. I drive up and down it daily, and I would support the officer's recommendation that this is not a suitable spot for development. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sully Richards. Councillor Lawson. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I'd like to reiterate what both Councillor Hawkins and Councillor Davies actually said. The actual pictures there is, in reality, it's actually a very small site. It is by a main road. There's a bus stop there. His access onto the Style Common Road would probably be would probably cause problems as well. But also, the actual land that they're actually going to build on, I can't see other than a, a little summer house what else they could actually be building on there. Thank you, Councillor Lawson. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. Thank you, Tom. Um, I don't think there's any further comments, and we have a mover and a second of four, the refusal of officers' recommendations. So I think we... Better did you want... No, no. Okay, sorry. So I think Richard will move to the vote. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So we've uh, 
It's been moved by Councillor Hawkins, seconded by Councillor Davis. So this is a vote to refuse the application as, uh, as outlined in the submitted report. So Councillor McGuinn. For refusal. Councillor Firth. For refusal. Councillor McGrath. For refusal. Councillor Lee Richards. For refusal. Councillor Greaves. For refusal. Councillor Socko. <laughs> Councillor Davis. For. <clears throat> Um, where's Councillor Davis gone? Four. Yeah, sorry, Councillor yeah. Hawkins. Four. Yeah. Councillor Homewood. Yeah, four. Councillor Lawson. Four refusal. Councillor Ulla. Four. Uh, so that application is refused as outlined in the report. Thank you, everybody. <coughs> that concludes our meeting. Uh, thank you for your attendance.